What is up, everybody? Welcome to Sidious Mag Live from the World Athletics Championships. It is day five. We hit the halfway point. Kyle, how are you feeling? I actually feel pretty good. Yeah. Better than expected, despite us, you know, doing a lot, being busy. Fortunately, we're not very far from the stadium, so it's been easy for us to run back and forth. Yeah. And I mean, we've kind of to for if this is your first time tuning into this, we've we got four episodes of this show already on our channel that you can go back and watch because we're just pulling guests left and right today's guest list looks kind of crazy so for the people um tuning in here's who you can expect on today's show uh we're gonna lead off with maurice green fan favorite from our first uh day here in eugene um the former world record holder in the 100 meters he's run 978 he came on the show and he gave us a lot of his predictions and thoughts on the sprints uh especially ahead of the 100 meter finals and then the next morning we got a knock on the door and he was right on a lot of things and so you'll get to hear that interview very shortly he knocked on the door and just said it was just like we weren't set up he didn't we didn't know he was coming but when maurice green knocks on your door and he wants to talk you you get the cameras out and you start tr talking about it and some really good insight um also to you know the Devin allen controversy right so then in addition to maurice green we also got the chance to sit down with world athletics president seb co uh kyle this is our first time meeting him in person yeah, we got some nice pounds. Uh, unfortunately, we, we did our best to try and get him to the house, but he's a busy guy right now. Yeah. So, you know, we had, we had to meet him somewhere else in order to have a conversation with him, but it ended up being an amazing conversation, and I think we already got a commitment for another one in the future. Yeah, in Budapest next year, so we got to book our hotel and uh, our plane tickets for that one. So, also in the show, we're going to have Marvin Bracey, the silver medalist in the 100 meters, uh, his training partner and really close friend, uh, 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 Trayvon Bromel, who took bronze, and our old co-host, our <laughs> former co-host from from March at the New Balance Nationals indoor meet. Uh, so it'll be really fun because I guess like anytime like we've gotten a chance to do one of these shows and spend some extended time with uh, an athlete, like it's I don't know, like they they're a bit more comfortable and familiar with us that when they see us in the mix zone, it's like we've we've done this yeah. before, and so um, we'll get to hear from those guys much later on in the show. In addition to that, we've also got uh, Joe Klecker from the On Athletics Club joining us. Uh, after running in the 10K, he placed ninth, which was an improvement from what he uh, did in Tokyo. Uh, we'll also have a pretty long interview, uh, but a really good interview with uh, two-time Olympic champion, former decathlon world record holder, Ashton Eaton. And so Kyle, what can people expect in, in that interview? Yeah, so a little bit different. Uh, Ashton is now, in the corporate world, you know, yeah, we, so we talked, you. we talked a lot about life beyond competing. And I think a really good, insightful conversation into the mind of an athlete who had competed at the absolute pinnacle of the sport and what that transition looked like afterwards and how he's doing today and advice that he'd have for other athletes. And the, I think this extends to whether, you know, you finish your high school career, your college career, or if you finished up as a double Olympic champion. It's a pretty evergreen conversation, I would say. Like, I got the chance to just kind of be in the room uh, and watch as it unfolded. And it's one of those kind of like you said, like, you, there's, you know, we're going to break these out much later on. You can always send that link to an athlete at, at whatever point they might be in their athletic journey, whether it's like they're starting to think about retirement or that next step. Um, I think there's some valuable nuggets of information there that they can look forward to. And then we've also got... Um, uh, M Bates on the show after running the marathon La yesterday we got the chance to talk to to Cam Levins and uh, you know it's I, I got to commend these marathoners for like the day after I would barely be able to move out of my bed yeah and they're I built mean, different but that's me yeah you know Team USA had a, a wonderful day out on the course and so mm -hmm. excited to hear more about it and uh, I'm sure she feels amazing right now all right so we're gonna get things started now with our chat our surprise chat with Maurice Green who knocked on our door Mag house. I was like, well, well, we're not allowing anyone into this house anymore. And then I go and check, and I was like, Maurice Green is at the door, and he's and, and he just came to prove his point that we had you on the show the first day. And so far, everything you've said so far has come true. Maurice, welcome back. It's it's your time to brag. You 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 can come in here and say I was right. I I, I don't have to brag. Brag, you know. Um, I, I'm not one of those people to say I told you. 
told you so. But, <laughs> but I, you no, told I, know, so. I, I told you I would come back, so I just came back. <laughs> yeah. So I, I try to keep my word. No, I appreciate it. So now, you know, we spoke to you at the very beginning. Yes. Since then, we've had a few big moments. And previously, we had spoken about how we thought this men's hundred would go. And you did. You kind of called how things would go. <laughs> yeah. Um, a- after I seen the first round, and then I thought the time was going to be a lot faster. But then when I when <clears throat> the next day came and then the weather was changing and the clouds was rolling in, I was like, it's not going to be as fast. But he'll still win. And I, I thought Marvin would get second. It's funny because it's perfect for the 1500 runners. They're thinking, <laughs> you know, the steeple chaser is, wow, it's a beautiful day. But it, it, a little too mild of temperatures for the sprinters. Well, not really that, but it, it, you, the air got a little heavy. Um, it got a little dense and things like that. And I was talking to Mike Conley because he does a lot of things with um, snipers. And we were talking about, I was like, yeah, this, that – the air and the temperature and stuff is changing. You can just feel like it. It's it's not the perfect day for sprinting, but they're still going to run fast. But does that change race plans in any way, or it's just no. expectations? It don't. It don't change the okay. race plan. But I mean, because everybody's dealing with the same thing, so every it's still everybody. It, it doesn't matter if it's raining. Everybody's dealing with that. So, um, no, nah, it, it's not going to change your race plan at all. I mean, you just still got to go out there and focus on that. Now, after Fred ended up winning the gold medal, he, someone had asked him, so why'd you run 9-7 in the first round? As if it was like, I mean, it's a fair question because like he said, it was like, because I, I ran 9-7, so the other guys had to go to bed thinking about that 9-7. I didn't. And I, I kind of remembered, it was like, you were here sitting here and, and talking to us about how mental it is. So what, what do you think the guys who went to sleep thinking about the 9-7 were, were, were dreaming of? I'm going to have to come out and do something a lot better. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to run 9-7 something to win this. That's what they're thinking about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, I mean, to come out there and, and run 9-7 in that first round, that's like a statement. Like, I'm ready. Y'all got to get ready. Mm-hmm. And and I think after you – because he was in the first round, and then you see everybody else run, and it seems like they're trying, but they're not quite there. And now they got to go back at night and be like, all right, I'm going to really have to bring it. Yeah, and then you you predicted Marvin would finish second. Trayvon ends up taking the bronze medal. Now, Christian Coleman was the one who we spoke with you, and you said how uh, the two of you have communicated uh, over the past couple years and that there was just something about him that it looked like he was just forcing it a little bit too much, and he wanted this. And, and it was very evident there in that final, and even in speaking with him after the race, he was you know, very open about, like, right. yeah, he's, he's, he's happy for the guys, but it stinks. He doesn't like to lose, right. and it's... You could... Yeah, I don't know. There was something about the final 10 meters of Christian. You could tell that, that it was what you said. Yeah, it's sad to say. I mean... And I mean, it, it, it's sad to say that it comes out like that. I mean, I said it, but I, I mean, I hope I'm wrong. Right. I hope. I hope he. It's does, from a point of love. Yeah. yeah. I, I hope he does better. But you could just, you, you could just tell. And even, even in the race, I mean, he really didn't even have that many phases. It was just like, let me get out and go. And he was there, but he floored it so much, the ending of his race faltered, and he just didn't have the end of it. And it's just like, man, Christian. But I, I'm sure he'll come back around. I know, but it, I mean, it, the state of U.S. sprints right now, after that in particular, it, we're in a healthy place. And kind of one of the big things that people were pointing out, because the, t- the the title in like the New York Times story was like Fred Curley's the world's fastest man now, and you know when people were looking for the successor to Usain Bolt, like that was the problem with the sport. Is I think we just threw so much star power at one person that when that person leaves, you're just left scrambling like. Well, what do we do now? And it's not not so that we need to be reliant on one star, but it is good that the world's fastest man now, you know, it's it's healthy when it's a Jamaican, when it's an American in those shoes because they they are the traditional sort of faces in that in that position. So like with Fred now getting this title, how do you sort of feel about his position in, uh, in the global landscape of taking on the title of world's fastest man? Yeah, well, well I, I will tell you, our our sport has a tendency to to pick one person and just try to put everything on them. Where even when you say was running, I was like, look, we have multiple stars and it's not just one person carrying the sport. They need to, you know, spread the love. But um, 
I, I think they picked the 100 meters the most because it's like the heavyweight championship of the world. Um, everyone can relate to it because at some point in your time in life, it, whether you were 2, 3, 4, 5, 12, 15, you said, I can get from here to there faster than you. <laughs> You've done that at some point in time. I mean, if if one person in this world hasn't did that, it, it would probably be a miracle. But I'm sure it's going to happen. So everyone can relate to it the most. And that's why it gets the most prestige and, and things like that. But I think Fred is very capable of of handling that situation and having that title. But, I mean, he, he I mean, it's not – He's not that far ahead of everybody else, mm-hmm. and that's what make it. In, that's what makes it interesting that we have a group of guys that's coming up, and it's they're still close together. And uh, on Fred's behalf, it's going to keep pushing him to get better because he can't. Yeah, he can't slack off at all. No, I like the fact that the the title could change hands. Like it just kind of well, adds already. intrigue. Yeah, <laughs> adds intrigue every like if next year all of a sudden it's like we just go and it's like who's gonna finish the year world's fastest man? That's one way of kind of billing it. That's super easy to translate for other people. Uh, one guy that I think in terms of star power and telling stories and rallying behind is Trayvon Bromel. The amount of injuries that he's had and coming back from that, when you're operating at those speeds, you have to be at absolute one hundred percent health in order to do it, or I feel like you're not able to fully exert yourself if you're worried about whether or not your Achilles is going to pop. Yeah, that, that's. I mean, whenever you go into it not 100% healthy and you have some little nagging energy, injury, you're going to have that in your mind and be like, oh, I just hope I can make it through. And so that won't allow you to fully give everything that you want. Um, for the things that he's been through and to where he is now, it's a tremendous ability. Now, how do we, because we've been talking to a couple of people and like, we're in this track bubble right now where like everyone who's here is a track fan. And that was an uh, amazing moment for just the sport in general. It's Team USA sweeps the medals in the hundred meters. Now everyone here is excited. It didn't seem to make as much noise in sort of like the mainstream media. Like, what do you think could be done better? Like, it doesn't have to be done in the next couple of days. These guys have, you know, other races to run, you know, whether it's the relay or the 200 that like you can't just throw them into, you know, to do all these late night talk shows and all that kind of stuff. But there is some sort of level where it's like we need to promote these guys, I think, in the next couple of weeks to really kind of take this momentum and run with it. What do you, what ideas do you think you might have? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that that's always the the situation with our sport is how can we get the masses to recognize how great it is and to give them, you know, the publicity that they're due. Um, and they won't pick a lot of them to go on to the late night shows. And did you probably, do that stuff? I, I did a couple of late night shows Very and cool. things like that. So, um, I mean, it'd be easier for them now because they're here in America and now they can call and be like, Hey, we want to get them and boom, he can go there. I was in Europe somewhere and had to fly back home and then come and then <laughs> go back. But, um, I mean, uh, that, that's just the nature of the beast that we're in. And, and I think it, it is up to, uh, like, the big networks to um, put more focus on it. Because, I mean, they will, but they won't give us that much. I, I mean, it, it, it goes back. I, I, I didn't really want to bring it up. But it goes back to, like, when I sprayed my shoes out mm-hmm. with the fire extinguisher, like everybody picked it up and it was on it was on sports center it was on everything for about 2 weeks straight it's yeah. like every every day something new about that would come out and i was like ah oh, i love that <laughs> so <clears throat> not not saying i mean I, I i think if the athletes you know show a little bit more personality um i think it's going to take um i think people gravitate to teams mm-hmm. a lot and if somehow we could make teams, like little cluster teams yeah. around, and then people will gravitate to that team and be able to follow that team and know what they're doing, that that will bring us up more 
even though we'll be a team, but we're individual at the same time. That's what's uh, kind of boggled me a little bit about the the, the pro sprints is that these training groups, like I, they they are they can be teams. It's like some of them are like John Smith's group, like that could be a team. But yep. the, the problem is like so many there's different sponsors, and I think that's where we kind of get in our own way. It's like this athlete sponsored but by in this, a football that. team. How many how many different sponsors it's are true. that that the athletes have? It's true. Yeah. We just gotta get the people with money. You know. <laughs> Y'all billionaires, come put a team together, put some money behind you, and get your friend to get his team, and then y'all compete against each other and see who the best. We yeah, have right? a lot of billionaires who watch. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> it's like wait, what's I stopping mean, Team Amazon versus I, Team Apple and all that stuff? Yeah. I, no, you know what would be t- Team Amazon against Team Musk, Elon Musk, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know them two don't like each other. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna make it to the moon Mars before you. I'm gonna fly in. Mean, yeah. The moon's too far. Let's just go 100 yeah, meters. Yeah, <laughs> let's just let's just go to the point of outer space. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they both trying to top one another. One can have one team. One can have another. They do a draft. Them two, put them together. I guarantee it'll be so much publicity around that. That'd be, that'd be fun. Where did you watch the race in stadium? And then how did that atmosphere when, you know, Trey's name popped up on screen? And we knew that they swept. Like, where were you, and how did that compare to maybe some other moments of being in big um, stadiums in your life? I, I um, I was in I was in the USA section when the hundred went off, and uh, me and Mike Conley was up there watching watching the hundred meters there. So, um, it was it was great. Yeah. Wait, then, are the two of you like trading predictions? Are you like who you got? It, no, we weren't no. trading predictions. <laughs> I mean, I just told him what I think. Yeah, I mean, like, man, you was right, right on the money, <laughs> right on the money. So, oh uh, yeah, it was good. On the flip side, on the women's side, it, Jamaica brought out their brooms, and that, uh, but it's I I know, and 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 I and I said I I thought we would I I as the rounds was going through, I the first round I was like, yeah, we might be able to get one, but after the semifinals went, I was like, it's going to be really hard for us to pull to get one in there. And then um, I, I just thought Jefferson, I think she's, she, I mean, this is her first time here. She's been running a long season. I just didn't think that she would have what it would take. And then when I seen Hobbs, she was all bandaged up and she wasn't like yeah, that she before. Her in front of yeah. us, right? She, she wasn't like that before. And I was like, nah, this don't look good for us. Um, but our, our women have always been strong. I, I think they're coming. But we're gonna have to do something a little bit, a little bit more to catch up to the Jamaican women because they they have a couple of young ones that are still running fast and we haven't even seen them yet. So um, we got some work to do. You think uh, Melissa has that potential to really go on the next few years and be a podium athlete? Because when I watch her, you know, she's obviously powerful, but like she's quick, right? Like that's yeah. her thing, and you know, she's not super tall. She, you know. She is really, really good and young, and but looking a few years ahead, you see like some things now that it's like, all right, she's got it. Well, it, it, it's all about doing what works best for you. I mean, yeah, she's shorter, but I mean, she can still. Shelly Ann's short too, so what's the difference? I mean, you can still do things and are capable of doing things. You just have to be do it, do it your way, and what works best for you, and and really try to figure out your race pattern not just try to get to the finish line. Mm-hmm. So, um, Shelly, and now 37? 35? 35. You know, yeah, one of those. Yeah. You know, but, you know, since 2007, <laughs> 2008, she's been, you know, the best of the best. How do you, like, h- how? <laughs> how is she still doing that? Not every, you um, know, people but, have a few-year peak, but she's been able to do it for 14 years. Yeah, but if, if, you, if you look at the nature of the sport, I mean, she started – really young Mm -hmm. um but if you look at women in general it seems like women can hold on a lot longer than the men and as they get older they are better at the at the later ages of their career and that's where she is right now so if you look at that like that that's why so that gives us hope because all of our girls are really young and as they come up and then hopefully as they are progressing in the sport, they get faster and we can start competing with them. Mm-hmm. 
No, I mean, it's it's we we talked about this last night when we were recording our podcast. It's not like we have any sort of like animosity towards the Jamaicans for being this good. We actually are kind of like in awe, but we at the same time want our girls to also of course be part I mean, of that. Of course, I mean, you you always want to be amongst the best. Yeah, you know, nobody just want to go to a party with just. You know, it's just some regular people. You want to go to a party where you see the stars. Let me see them stars, and let you know, I want to party why with them. Back, he yeah. was like, he's like, I, he's like, I saw the Instagram post so, that Grant, Grant was going. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it, yeah, we are in awe, but I think it's it's fuel for us at the same time. It it should be for the younger, for the girls out there who didn't make it here or who were here and just didn't quite run the best. Um, I would say it was like me in '96. I went to the Olympics, and the U.S. men didn't get a get a medal or anything. And I was like, "That really hurt. I don't ever want to see that happen again." As as long as I got something to do with it, it will never happen again. And you know, you go to work, and then next year I win, and then we keep winning, and you know. So hopefully, it it fuels our young women um, to want to go out there and. You know, hey, we gotta we gotta just start taking it one spot at a time. Yeah, we don't have to take over all, but just you know, let's get it. Let's get one, and then when one come, another will come. Because if you notice before, it was the U.S. women, but then Shelly Ann comes, and then the next one comes, and now they're all come. All it takes is one first. Mm-hmm. Got to come through the door first, and then everybody else will come after. So last night we were hanging out in the mix zone, waiting for the. 100 ladies to come through, do through, do some interviews, but they end up taking off because they have the 200 to get ready for. So right. there was no press conference. So there's yeah. no press conference, which maybe a couple of people were upset. We were like, yeah, no, that makes sense. Like you have to, it was getting Cause, late. Because you understand. Yeah, but. But yeah we, 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 we get it. And how difficult is it to bounce back for another race immediately after? Like these, these high, high moments, you came here, you're getting a medal, and it's like, well, now you have to go to sleep tonight. Yeah. I mean, you're you're gonna you're gonna be on a high, <laughs> your, your your adrenaline still is gonna be flowing. Um, the best way I can explain it to people um, that's not in the sport, you got to be like a quarterback, and you just threw an interception, and you're down by two touchdowns. That quarterback got to come out there. We got to score. He can't just keep dwelling on that. I mean, okay, you won. All right, you can't dwell on it because the job is not finished. You, this is two weeks long. We gotta, you got another race to go to. Thank you. I won that one. Now your mind quickly switches over to the 200, and you start getting into that mode because now it, it's a little bit different than 100, and now you got to start focusing on that. You take one step at a time. Mm-hmm. I think we've got one more bone yeah. uh, to pick your brain about. Uh, this reaction time issue from last night. I hate it. Did like, you guys have reaction time? Like, when did that come on the scene? Like, when that technology... Um, no, it, it, it came on... I can't remember the year, but I remember... I, I, I'll tell you a story. I remember in, in World Championship Indoors when it was in Tokyo. Um, it was the very first round, and I was just on. I, I, I was really on, and we started the race. They called us back. And they didn't really say anything, but then we started the race again. They called us back, and the guy came and said, Maurice, if you do that again, we're going to have to throw you out. Like, what? And I'm like, you're a false start. And I'm like, I know I didn't false start. but And I'm like, okay. All right, so he was like, sit, pow. And I let the – I went, I said, one, one, and then I took off. Everybody was gone, and I just ran everybody down. And that just <laughs> made me mad. I was – I was – I was pissed off because they was messing with me during the rounds, and I was like, "That's, that's stupid." Because I'm not false starting; mm-hmm. I'm just reacting to, I'm reacting and anticipating. Because what I would do, I would listen to the starter, and starters get on a rhythm. So if you can catch that rhythm, you can go exactly when you need to. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I guess like, why this might be a really stupid question. So let's pretend I'm doing it for the audience. When yeah. people do false start, why did they false start? Is it well, like what causes it? Are, are you trying to get ahead of the gun or? No, you. I, I, I mean, some people do it on purpose. Uh, I, I, I know 
before when we had one false. No, it was before we 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 have two. Then they brought it to one. Then it was done. So if people know they have two false starts, and you know you got a very good starter in there, yeah, one person with false starts. So now I got to hold him back a little bit because he don't want to jump. You know, jump the gun because if he jumped the gun, he'll be out. You know, they play games like that. Um, but I mean, you don't necessarily, uh, most athletes don't do it on purpose. Um, you're just anticipating the gun and sometimes you get it. Sometimes you don't, then you get out. But I mean, that, that's all part of, of racing though, of, of the competition. You have to be on edge. You have to be in there cocked, ready to go. I used to say, I want to be the bullet in the chamber when that, oh, I'm going, I'm going. So what's your suggestion for, I guess, like, well, maybe you're okay with the current rules, but if you could make any adjustments. No, I'm way- not okay with the current rules okay. because that rule has been made up for, uh, I would say, maybe eight, nine, ten years now. But what they don't understand is people progress. People get better. Man gets better. Technology gets better. And as that happens you can perform better. So who is to say you can't start legally in point zero nine? Who says you can't do that? We seen it last night. I think we seen it last night twice because I don't think the girl fall started either. It was like, come on, man. Y'all, you, you, we always do stuff to mess up our sport. Like and disqualifying like, Usain Bolt for <laughs> the world chance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, it, it, it's something that they got to figure out. I mean, it's not humanly possible to do it. We've seen it. I'm going to pitch you on two ideas, and you can you can say out or you're in. So one idea, and this I don't I don't know if I'm in or out on this one. Some people say if you false start, then you you get moved back maybe a couple meters. Like instead of saying <laughs> you're gone, it's a penalty. <laughs> no, nah, not not for that one. <laughs> okay. Not for that one. Because now it's an unfair advantage. Yeah. It's it's an uh, they have a race in Australia called the Botany Bay Gift. And yeah. they they they, they <laughs> you have on the grass people, track. Yeah, you have people starting at different areas on the track depending on your speed and things like that. And I had to start from scratch. And there was a lot of other people who had, you know, five, ten, eight. And maybe 12 meters on me, and I had to run them all down. I ran it once. I was like, I never <laughs> want to run that race again. That was the hardest race I ever ran. Um, but that, that, that part is not um, really fair. You want it to be fair, so you can't move them back any, any, anything like that. Then it's a circus. Like now, now yeah. we're like playing games. We're changing. Yeah, sport. now yeah, it, that's a gimmick. Yeah, no, it's a good way to think. All right, so here's my second one that I think maybe you might like a little bit better. So, you know, we have one one thousandth right now is the threshold. Or what is it? It's point one zero zero zero. Yeah, is point yeah. zero. What's the decimal? No, it's point one zero zero. OK, so. So he went point zero nine nine. So let's say instead of. You can't even blink that fast. But. If, if there's a threshold, let's say anywhere from, you know, point zero five to point one you get a rerun. So you, we don't disqualify the athletes. It's like, hey, that was maybe a little bit too good. It's questionable, but we'll give the athletes the benefit of a doubt. And rather than DQing you, that's the warning on the field. How about this? How about if it's just a blatant false start, you're out. So <laughs> point zero zero zero. <laughs> yes. If okay, it's a yeah. blatant false start, you're out. If it's not, let's go. You, okay, now we gone. Yeah, because I, because you, the at, I, I anticipate the gun. Yes, I'm going to anticipate, and as soon as I hear it, like, that's why some people false start when a camera goes off in the stands. You, well, not now because we everybody got cell phones, but when people had cameras, you and you hear that, some people goes and be like, man, somebody shooting the camera or something like that. That'll make you go. Like, you're on edge. Yeah. You're you're you are anticipating the gun. That's yes. the athlete's risk. If they yes. want to do the, if they you know yes. Okay. If, if you blatantly come out of the blocks before the gun is sound uh, shot, you're out. Other than that, right out. It's the simplest solution. Yeah. If we had people like us in a room with like the world athletics and see, higher ups, they we would have never fixed. let people like us in there. Though, <laughs> uh, you know. We're sneaking yeah. our way into some rooms. <laughs> no, I, wait a minute. I, I, I'm gonna tell you, man. One one rule that was changed because of a former athlete, right, Sergey Bubka, right? 
when he used to break the world record, right? He would go over the go over the bar and it would be and he would put it back on there. He would touch the bar and make <laughs> it stay on there. When he got in there, you cannot touch the bar anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's the that's the key. I mean, you like, should get in there, and then you make up some rules. I would yeah, help but you. I'm not gonna make it to benefit myself. He wanted his world record and stuff <laughs> to be standing longer and be like, like he would break the world record like every other week. He would break the world record. He's touching the bar, <laughs> making sure it stays as he going as he comes over and he's holding his steel, and then he break the world record. Bonus, but bonus, now, bonus, yeah, bonus. <laughs> now, if you touch the bar with your hands, you're it's, it's automatic foul. You can't do that. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. the, the uh, what is it, pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Maurice, I hope you keep stopping by and just knocking on our door because this is fun. Like, I enjoy doing this. I appreciate you stopping by. Oh, just let me know when you want me to come. It, it doesn't, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Awesome. Thanks so Thanks. much. Thank you. Cool. All right. So Maurice was kind of laughing that we were just weaseling our way into rooms. And I don't think he, he thought it was probably a joke that we were going to sit down with Sebco at some point. So that interview is coming later on in the show. Yeah. Um, we had a great conversation with him. But now, just for anyone who's confused, we're now live. And we're fortunate to be sitting down with someone who should be very tired right now. Yeah. We're sitting down with seventh place marathon finisher here at the World Championships, Emma Bates, 223 marathoner now, right? 223. Wow. Weird. How's that yeah. feel? It feels great. I mean, to PR on a championship day, nothing better. Yeah, it's one thing to, you know, oh, I'm going to go time trial, but you did it in a, an actual championship race, no rabbits, had to perform on the day. That says something. Yeah, I mean, I my sights were set on a medal, and that was the only way to run it, was to just go out as hard as I could. I almost PR'd in the half marathon doing it, and it was, you know, it got really, really hard there the last, like, eight miles. So, But that's what you got to do when you're trying to, you know, represent your country. And then we asked you right before you sat down uh, if you wanted anything to drink, and you said, can I have a beer? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, of course, we have beer. And you said, it has to be Mexican beer. Yeah, so I actually have celiac disease. Oh. So Mexican beers are made with corn instead of wheat so these are my go-to but i i hate gluten-free beers so like the mexican beers are the only thing that i drink so. okay i thought you were just very particular i'm, for, I'm like <laughs> I yeah, like be. i came in seventh i'm i can ask for these things <laughs> yes, yes. but modelo is my all-time favorite by far sponsor yeah. <laughs> yes. so we got to watch the men's race and that was our first indicator that this is a fast course and it was it was flat because i you know I, it's not like a new york or boston you could just google like course profile or anything like that and if, so you must have known for quite some time like what to expect that this was going to be flat and fast so how did that play into sort of your training and then the way it unfolded I mean you, the field having sub two, several sub 220 women like that's a guarantee then and it's going to be very quick. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the lineup before I even started the race, so wow. I had no idea who was in the race. I didn't really. I had, Wait, you didn't look at who was in the race no. before I mean, the I world knew Sarah championships. And Kira were in the race, but no, I had no idea who else was in there. <laughs> That's incredible. <You're laughs> cool. I guess. Do you do that for other races too? Um. Yes. Like the ones that are like pretty important, I just try to keep the blinders on yeah. and just like you know control the controllables, whatever is in my you know insights for me. But like I don't want to worry about what other people are doing. Did you always do that? Like in college. Would you just show up? I didn't, up? and that's like when I got super nervous, and the pressure would overtake me, and I just like would worry too much about, you know, like I need to beat this person or I need to beat this person, and like just holding so much weight on like yes, beating certain people, and I don't like to do that anymore. You ever show up and you're like, oh shit. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. There's definitely those moments where I'm like, oh, or like people will like, you know, um, sign up later, so like my coach will be like, oh, like. You know, you're going to be in the top 10, definitely. But, like, oh, like, all of a sudden, like, you know, a few people sign up pretty late. You can just sign up for the late. world championships. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, like, world majors, definitely. Like, that people sneak in all the time. And it's just like, oh, geez, you know, like, may, maybe top 15 this time. So that's kind of, like, the mentality going into it. So going in blind... You, it, when do you start to have those moments of, it, was it on the start line just looking around it's like, oh, I think I know that one. <laughs> I think I know that person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously like the Kenyan and Ethiopian teams <laughs> are stacked always. And so I knew they were going to be fast and the course is fast, but I didn't, I didn't look at the course beforehand either. Like I, I knew 
like there was three loops, but I didn't know like if there was any hills or really anything about it. So I like to go in blind that way too, not knowing the course. Um, and once like we went through that first K, I was like, oh, they're not messing around today. We're going to be running fast. The men ran fast. So here we go. Like this is, this is it. You've obviously been to Eugene numerous times before this. So you must have run parts of that course previously probably like the river path but like not on the roads or anything like that so just yeah the, along the river there does joe go in blind or joe's doing the, the i research? don't know how far joe goes into like um just you know thinking about like race tactics and logistics and all that stuff i mean he was he was mentioning to me that i should probably go look at the course but i was like eh. <laughs> So I'm just curious, as someone who's never actually raced a marathon before, like what do the legs feel like today? They actually don't feel bad. And it's because I've never gotten treatment after a marathon before. And yesterday I did for the first time. And I kind of got like coarse into it because I had drug testing and I went right away. Uh -huh. Like I got to drug testing, had to go, was great. But you after have a to, marathon, I can. It's. I it's. I was pretty impressed with myself. We yeah. were. Was it Grant who was saying that he always lines up having to pee so that way mm -hmm. he's unbelievably fast in drug testing? But yeah. I imagine after a marathon, it's probably the, you know the one event that you sit around waiting a few. Yeah, hours. Grant Holloway can hold it for thirteen seconds. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about two hours. <laughs> yeah, most people it takes them like a couple hours for sure. But I was in and out of there like. To, to go to the bathroom and but as I was filling up like the the testing um, bottles I screwed it on the wrong way and so once you screw it on you can't get it back off and it wasn't on so like it'll leak and you you know you don't want urine everywhere right so <laughs> definitely so not. we had people like I was trying to unscrew it and then we had um, one of the massage guys come and unscrew it but he couldn't do it so we recruited Ryan Hall to come in and so Ryan Hall's trying, trying to unscrew your urine tube yep yep wow. um, and so we couldn't get it so we're like if we can just <laughs> it was a scene it was a scene you guys we could not figure this out like and i guess this happened to a um thrower the day before and he just like popped it on which like you know i mean uh, ryan's like a you know a pretty strong guy but he's not like a, a thrower bit, yeah. you know he's not a, a yeah. world medalist at the olympics or i mean at the world championship if it was like an anamorph it's like before i become a thrower i become ryan hall yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's exactly that's, that's, what a, it transition. Is. that's a transition <laughs> but so uh, eventually he ended up like using his foot and like jamming it on there <laughs> They're they're stomping on they're your stomping urine, on my tube. urine samples. Yes, yes. <laughs> Trying to get this cap on so that I don't have to do another urine sample. So he he ends up like slamming on it. Well, it breaks, and so, <laughs> so urine is everywhere. <laughs> Surprise of the century! Stomping on a small tube of urine will cause breakage. <laughs> Wow. I was like, I was about to be mortified if it was everywhere. Thank goodness it was contained. But it was just like, oh my God, this is such a like ridiculous thing that's happening. And it's, it was like 30 minutes of us trying to get this thing on. Eventually, like, you know, again, like it's broken. So we have to redo it. You had to so, wait. So that's when you got work done. That's when I got work done. Um, sorry, this is a very long story. No, no it's, it's, it's a very long stream. <laughs> we have all day. And also something that people don't typically get to hear about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I was pissed because I was like, I already oh, went. Oh, yeah. Oh, Yes, right? uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, pun intended. Um, because I had to do a whole new urine sample, and it's like, I mean, I you you're not hydrated at all after a marathon and like that was it that's all I had in me so I had to just like down a bunch of Gatorades and get you know so that was when I got the massage and <laughs> might I was as well like, may as well I'm gonna be sitting here for a while and that is that is the key to like actually you know flush out the system after a marathon like I don't know what I was doing before. <laughs> like, I, it seems like I'm not yeah. going to do that. You, I mean, you've been training for months. Like the yeah. second you cross the finish line, there's no cool down. There's no massages. Yeah, you have yeah. months until you race right, again. Right. Month, like that's when I never get future massages, Emma problem. I never get like treatment. I don't like really? see a chiropractor PT or anything like that. Like I just, I raw dog it. <laughs> 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 wow. <Okay. laughs> so then, all right. So now blessing in disguise. Cause now you actually feel yeah. pretty good. Yeah. I did catch you walking back and we were joking the other day because we saw Grant Fisher walking around by himself mm -hmm. a couple hours after his race in Eugene and then yesterday I caught you just walking by yourself like <laughs> a block from the stadium by yourself where were you going 
I was going to Egg Alley to, <laughs> to do some shots. Um, Aisha uh, was very adamant that I get there so that she could buy me some celebratory shots. So we all did some shots there before the meet started. Before the meet. We're before the evening session. Made yeah. the oh, meet wow. a little bit more fun, probably. Yeah, yes, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I wasn't just wandering out by myself, just like a loner. Like, I do have friends, you guys. <laughs> oh, you so were meeting Cor- Corey yeah. must have had a really rowdy, like, oh, cheer section. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, we, we ended up going to Egg Alley after her race, too. And, like, she got, like, so many standing ovations like coming in there and like everybody was like wanting to buy her drinks and everything like that it's it's really nice to be you know an american and and do well any day any day but yes <laughs> but like to be at the world championships like i mean everybody was just so behind us and so much support so. we haven't had beers in the stadium yet that's like no we haven't something that is available to us yeah so and when people have always new. talked about yeah like oh we got to sell beer at the stadium that's going to cure you know the track and field and it's so working so it's far working people are having fun yeah. uh we shared the photo of the three of you embracing at the finish line and can you describe that moment I guess because everyone is sharing that on their Instagram stories it's gotten a ton of likes out there and so I mean there's that love of the people who aren't in Eugene just kind of taking inspiration from that moment that the three of you kind of put on display yesterday so what has that been like sort of the reception Uh, I'm sure your phone is still blowing up I had no idea how much this meant to people, this performance. I knew how much it meant to me. I knew how much it meant to Sarah and Kira. But for the outpouring of support, I mean, you would think that we got, you know, we swept the the podium. And that's, like, so cool that people just appreciate our performance for what it was. Because, I mean, we could have done everything. um, I mean, I think we did everything right in the race and, like, still, like, you know, came up short um, in our eyes. So, like, there's a bit of disappointment not being able to reach the podium, any of us. But, like, that was, a, I mean, a, a meet record, right, mm-hmm. um, that the woman won in. And so, like, there, there was nothing that we could do. Like, we put ourselves in position to be in contention during that race, and we worked together the entire time. And, like, that's something that, like doesn't happen very often is to find each other in a race and have the same kind of like ability level at the same time and be able to push each other in that way. So when um, Sarah was waiting for me at the finish line, I was just like, I mean, she's one of my running idols, like has been for a very long time. And when she ran at Stanford and then when she went pro as ASICS and she did every event under the sun and finally found her niche in the marathon and is, you know, like has um, these foster children that she she's raising right now and just is like doing such amazing thing for all these charitable organizations organizations and like she just like is who I want to be when I grow up and so to see her just standing at the finish line just like waiting for you know me to cross and like that embrace was just so special and then to see Kira come in right behind me like I had no idea Kira was right there and so that was like a moment of just I don't, I don't think any marathon will top. Like, I mean, even if I win a major or something like that, that those are my goals. Like, yesterday was the epitome of, like, my running career. We'll check back with you when you do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, like, if the emotions couldn't get any higher, then all of a sudden Joan Benoit Samuelson oh comes gosh. out and, and hugs you guys. What did she say to the three of you? She was so proud. Like, she was just like, this is, this is the epitome of female distance running right here. Like, you guys did it. And, like, just for her to say that, like, is, is something that I never, thought I would be in a position to hear you know like I, I've always wanted to make teams but like to actually make a team and to make people that proud is well, I don't know it's I'm speechless yeah so, I got goosebumps yeah well now at this point in your career you've become really consistent in the marathon which I think is like something worth celebrating in and of itself like of course you want to go and you want to knock like the ball out of the park every single time and get that medal and you know the home run but at this point like you just keep hitting like doubles and triples right like you just are consistently running great and you're not striking out ever like you've got to start feeling proud about that body of work in and of itself right yeah i mean that's like the whole basis of our training is like never overcook yourself you know like I want to have a long career and people that I try to model my career after like Dina and Desi because like I mean it took them a while to get to like you know their their peak but like that's what I want to do and I want to take it step by step and yesterday was a huge step in the right direction and like I mean I wanted to run like more like 220 yesterday and like of course podium but like this is this is a huge huge deal for me and so like going forward I just have so much more momentum. That confidence, it just sounds really cool to, to hear from you, just kind of given, you know, the ups and downs over the past couple of years. But really, we did get, you know, our first big sign of you, you know, finding your calling in the marathon at the trials and then, you know, Chicago last year. So CIM, US CIM, champ. Right. And so like over the years, stats. Does, <laughs> the marathon doesn't get any easier. 
right? It doesn't. And, and, but that's like the beauty of it. Like every, every marathon has its own uniqueness and like, you never know what you're going to get. Like conditions are going to be different. There's going to be different people and you're going to be, I mean, you can only run two a year. I mean, if you're, you know, not crazy. You're Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not that crazy. You want to be like least. her, you like know, you got to start running. Yes. Yes. Mad. Yes. Um, I'm only 30. So I got some time before I start doing like 10 a year. It's fine. Um, got to work my way up to that. But yeah, no, it's just like, it's really cool just to, to see like my progression. And I'm just like, uh, just to be sandwiched between those two women is, uh, so so cool. I, I like just... that you said you're only 30 because it's interesting because <laughs> I'm 31 and I'm dying. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's such a cool element of the marathon is it's like uh, it's a rebirth of your career in many ways. Um, you know, we hear track athletes all the time. You know, they're in their second cycle and it's like you know they're considering retiring. Even some of the best, but you had a whole track career yeah. before and I know you hop on the track every now and then but that's more probably for a training stimulus than you know representing the US of the world championships does it feel like you're a totally new runner now than a few years ago completely like I never knew that I could feel so comfortable and like so at home in an event before and I just always felt like I was scraping by just like trying to keep up and just like killing myself to like you know just make the the trials or you know USA's and the 10,000 meters and I just was like well maybe I just don't have it maybe I just don't have what it takes but I just I believed in myself so much that I would find something that I would be good at and I just like kept working hard at it and it took me many many years to find the marathon and I knew that it would take me a long time to get good at the marathon um but it's just yeah it feels like it, yeah like you said a rebirth it's just something that um I don't think many people get to experience so I'm very lucky I got to do a podcast with Corey about like two weeks ago and I picked her brain about two things first thing I wanted to hear from you about is just sort of the the numbers and the X's and O's guys that that Joe is like and so like can how does that work with you because Corey says she doesn't like to kind of dive into you know the nitty-gritty of workouts and stuff it's, it's more like she's she's there to learn it, she, she she's more interested in like the race tactics and how things unfold and she lets the splits and all that stuff to joe so what about you like how do how do you operate within the training group i'm the exact same way me and corey are very similar and like i do not care i once like anybody starts talking about numbers i'm just like like <laughs> it just goes up way over my head so i'm more like the mental side of it too and like that's what i love talking to joe about is he is like he loves the physiology he's such a science and, and data guy but he also just like gets what it takes to like be good through the mental aspect of training and so um it's just so fun to like he can kind of nerd out with like some of the other people on the team but with me and Corey, i think it's more just like you know the nitty-gritty of just like putting your head down getting the work done and just seeing what you can do Something that I really appreciate that you do, and if Mac hears me, maybe he'll he'll pull it up and drop it in the chat. You share what you do on Strava, and you know you're, the numbers. I like the numbers, and seeing the amount that you run and how fast you run, but also how slow you run sometimes, is really cool. So why do you why are you so open to sharing that much? Yeah, I don't think. Um I, I need to be transparent to everybody or anything like that, but I, I like people to kind of have some insight into my journey and knowing, you know, like I'm, I'm out there every day, you know, working really hard, but also there are those easy days. So I have to give it up to soft hour in Boulder. I was um, going to say, <laughs> shout out to, to the track club the guys, tra the track team. So th it is amazing. Like we, every Wednesday will run like eight minute play pace or slower and um, just like enjoy each other's company and everything like that. Um, so I want people to know that like, you don't need to, you know, kill yourself every single day. Like there, there are days where I'm like out the door at like nine, 10 minute pace, you know? Um, but I don't necessarily think I need to like share splits and everything. If people want to go into that. They can. Um, I do. I'm, yeah, no, you can go <laughs> for it, but I'm about like the fun facts, of course. So yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> The other part that I discussed with Corey was uh, the Emma effect. It's just kind of like a couple months back, there was a New York Times, or years uh, ago, there was a New York Times article about how Shalane Flanagan uplifts like all the women around her at the Bowerman Track Club, and it was, I think, titled The Shalane Effect. And so after the uh, interview that Kyle did with her at USA's that got everybody crying. Did you cry? Did you cry watching oh. it? Oh my gosh, I'm still like crying about it. Just thinking about it. Are you kidding me? Like, not a lot of people pull out that kind of emotion now. Like, yeah. you, and you did it so effortlessly. I didn't so, know. Yeah, I just asked a question. So, is the 
Emma effect real and how does it work with you? A hundred percent real. Emma is like the most unique special person that has been given to this sport, to this earth, honestly. Like she, even if she didn't run, she would be like the most amazing person. Like beyond, she transcends like, you know, just the sport itself because she's just so caring. Like for instance, after um, her USA win, her 10th national title, she knew that I had a 400 meter workout that morning um, in Eugene. And she came over to me on her victory lap and hugged me and was like, how was your workout this morning? I was like, <laughs> That, that's crazy. Are you kidding me right yeah. now? What did you, you say? Just, Were you like, oh, I didn't go as well as I was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so give yeah, a couple splits. You have a minute to listen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm like, you need to stop right now. You are an amazing person. And like, she is just so like selfless and so caring. Like, even if she's not your teammate, she just cares so much about like, just people just bettering themselves every single day. Because I mean, yeah. And again, just being around her, you just want to be a better person. Yeah. Did you see who walked in our backyard? Yeah, what, what was that? <laughs> it was RG3. We'll bring him on in a oh bit. My um, <laughs> what is going on at the City of Madhouse? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, so, Emma, I guess where do we go from here in terms of just like taking this performance? I know it's like you're what, a day removed from running a marathon. It's it, You don't want to start thinking too far ahead of, of, you know, or maybe you already have some some fall plans lined up that maybe you can't announce yet, but uh, is, is there a fall marathon in the cards? And when does that, do you get a little break now? I get like a week. I no, think. you deserve two. <laughs> yeah. Joe, two. Because <laughs> I got to get ramped up, you know? Like I I forewent to spring marathon to focus on the world championships. Which for those who aren't familiar, that's money. Yes, that's a lot of money. Like it's kind of kills me to think. How about much? That. No, okay. oh, it's, it's ugly. But um, I I just wanted to put all my eggs in this basket yeah. because like representing you know the U.S. team on U.S. soil is like something that's not going to come around again. So I needed to take the opportunity. Um, and I know some other people can do it, but I I just wasn't willing to risk it. Um, so now I'm doing a fall marathon um, after you know Worlds, which. I've never done one this close to another marathon before, so it's going to be tough. But doing the um, math, what would yeah, be? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I basically have like you know, twelve weeks ish. So. So, okay. you know, in one week, you have one week to relax. Are you spending it all in Eugene, just here at Agate <laughs> Alley, taking shots before <laughs> track meets? I mean, I still have teammates racing, so like I'm going to be here and I'm going to be representing, or I mean, uh, supporting all my my team uh, USA athletes. And um, yeah, I mean, I just love Eugene. Like it's such a cool scene. Like even without running, it's just like a really nice place to be. And um, I'm definitely going to celebrate with all my Boulder people and all that. Um, but yeah, no, it's I'm going to soak it all in as much as I can as I'm here. Now, before we bring on our next guest, I kind of want you to connect the dots a little bit of just, uh, we had Josh Awatunde here yesterday, and he's gone viral for his celebration, saying that he got lit at Denny's. Uh, <laughs> I still laugh thinking about it. I mean, I laugh when I see the picture. Yeah. Um, but you had a little bit of a run-in with Josh, right, at the <laughs> at the hotel. So it's really funny. This is the, uh, the Team USA universe connecting. It's so also like, it's a reward for our dad. Alley yeah, viewers. So <laughs> for paying attention, it's like you you understand throwback references. So you got to see them coming back from McDonald's as you were getting ready to go run the marathon. Is that how it was? So marathon was at six fifteen a.m. So I have to get up at three a.m. to you know <laughs> eat breakfast. And so I was going down into the lobby and I'm making you know my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and stuff and you know getting my coffee and they're just you know chowing away on the mcdonald's just like i mean there was not a lo lot of light left in their <laughs> eyes i mean it was like 3 30 a.m um at that point and they are just i mean pretty rowdy and i just didn't expect anybody to be down there at 3 a.m like what um and they were just like what event do you do oh so is that a distraction or does that keep you loose oh i loved it oh. it was so <laughs> funny to me like just seeing them all out there and i'm just like what a different world this is right now yeah. <laughs> we're crossing paths right now and they were so excited they're like oh my gosh good luck amazing well did they come out like how were the crowds and you know because holy cow it seemed like you had plenty of people cheering for you and I you were did hyping not them up expect people to show out and it was I mean, lined the entire way. I think there was only a couple quiet portions, but like people were like out on the bikes and everything too. Did this, you like that? That was 
most incredible thing. I think every marathon needs to have a stretch where people can just bike or run next to you because it was just like the energy was, I mean, palpable. Like they were chanting USA at us the whole time too. And just like, I mean, my coach and my, the rest of my teammates were biking next to me and just like kind of, you know, just giving me support the entire time. And like, that was just so amazing. So in the theme of cycling, do you like the Tour de France, people jumping in and running, not obviously next to you guys, right. but running along the side? Is that fun? Heck is that a yes. cool thing? Absolutely. That's what the sport needs. Like, get rid of all, like, the gates and, like, the fences and stuff like that because I I just feed off that energy so much. I need that energy. So we need more of that in this sport for sure. You should go watch the 2004 Olympic marathon. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, it can get a little messy at times. I, I know so that. Far. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, definitely within reason. Like, I mean, they figured it out with the Tour de France. So like, let's do we that. We can do here, it. Man. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Yeah. Emma, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us. This has been fun and I'm now going to be doing the math seeing what marathon's like 12-ish <laughs> weeks away from us So for our next opportunity to get to see you in action. Are we so. bringing someone new on? You can s stay and hang out if you want. You can, yeah, we'll bring on if you have other things right. to do. Yeah. Oh yeah, get, get the boulder right out here. I'm All right. You have nothing to do? Also. No, let's hang All out. Right. All right, let's bring you on. You have to ask questions though because okay. now it's yeah. Joe's All time. Right. All right. Okay. All right, now we're bringing on on Athletics star uh, of uh, star 10,000 meter ninth place finisher here for Team USA, Joe Klecker, the US champion. How could I forget that one? Uh, Joe, there's a mic right there. Just pick yours. Yep, there, there you go. go. Joe, how are you feeling? You're thanks two for days. coming. Yeah, thanks yeah, for coming. Thanks for having me. No, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, people have been asking like how the body's doing after the race, and honestly, pretty good. Like after Tokyo, I probably didn't run for like four days until I got back to the States and uh, today I went out and ran and I felt really good and so I can't complain. So he, he said you're a star which I, I just want you to know like we realized anything we post of you does numbies as yeah. we call it in the business. <laughs> Did you feel that like you you got probably a good number of cheers out there. Yeah, I didn't get that out, out on the stadium. I just noticed when they said Grant's name, it was pretty loud. So <laughs> not, mine wasn't quite as loud. So I got to got to like uh, get a little bit bit faster maybe we'll work on that how big was uh the family and i mean on has flown out like uh, every single that double decker here. bus in our yeah. front yard yeah no it's been like uh, it's been really cool like on you know like the founder olivier's out here um like so many people within the brand the innovation team's out here and like when we go to zurich we see those guys they come to boulder usually in the fall and we do a lot and then for them to like kind of full circle be here at like our biggest competition of the year is really cool like just you know, getting my, I got a massage like day before the race from our physio and like our founder was on the table right before me. It's like pretty like small knit. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't Fun. kick him out. I let him have his massage, but, uh, it's like pretty, it's like pretty small knit like company and just really cool that like they're all out here supporting us. And like after my race, you know, I'm talking to like Olivier and he's just breaking it down. Like he was an athlete himself and totally understands, you know, what, what we're doing. And from when the top of the company understands that it's like definitely just trickles down to the athletes and we're like supported very well. Well, we're, we're here with Tracksmith, so they don't have shoes yet. So we can openly talk about this sort of stuff. Emma, what's it like being here with ASICS, you know, a major sponsor of the event? It's so weird because everybody keeps sending me photos of like my face everywhere. And I'm just like, <laughs> this is very bizarre. Like, I don't know if I'm worthy of that kind of praise right now, but um, that is really, really cool. And like, they have like so many accommodations and like pizza parties and like, oh, so it's just like a You guys a get pizza parties? Party. Haven't had a pizza party yet. Uh, oh, we'll talk, we'll that. talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys like that element of being sponsored athletes? I know some people it's like, ah, oh, headache. I got to go do an event or I got to do this photo shoot or something. How do you feel about it? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really cool to be like supported and promoted in that way. Cause like, I know when I went over to the diamond league in Oslo and I saw like the Inga Brixton's faces everywhere, it was like really cool. I was like, wow, this is like a big deal. And then like, I'm walking down the street and I see Emma's <laughs> face on the, on the storefront. And I'm like, you know, in a, in a way, like, it's cool that they're like doing that in the States now, like pr really promoting the athletes, these brands and like getting fans to know who the athletes are, because like, I think that's the only way they can really like connect fans to the athletes is like just you got to treat, you know, you got to like really promote the individuals in the sport. And so it's cool when you walk around town and see like what different brands are doing for their athletes. And so I definitely love being like a part of a brand. I think it like definitely just 
they like the way they can promote you. It just gives you more fans and like you really feel that support. So Chris has this problem in New York in which sometimes people recognize him in the park or something. Oh, yeah. and it's like Chris Chavez, Chris <laughs> Chavez. And then they want to turn around and they want to run with him. And the problem is anyone can run with Chris. <laughs> <laughs> But you are very fortunate in that, you know, you probably get recognized and then people turn around and they, like, they can't do clicker miles. Yeah. It was funny. I was out running today and uh, I definitely ran past quite a few people who recognized me. And one, one guy, I, he was a former Pac-12 runner. He was fast enough to run with me. So we were running like six minutes a mile today. Yeah, you're like, oh, Jesus, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Knock it but down. But it was nice, you know, because sometimes like people will try and run with you. It's like awkward when they like run with you and then they start to wanting to slow down or something. But yeah. this guy was like all for it and like ready to, ready to run. That's well. I mean, that's the beauty of this sport. I'm going to ignore your knock on me, but uh, it's just the fact that you're you're known for your clacker miles, and then you're you're out here praising soft hour, which is just running eight minute pace or slower. You can do it a lot of different ways, yeah. I guess. No, that's just awesome. Uh, so, Joe, in kind of in training for this particular race, like having won uh, the Olympic, having the Olympics under your belt. How did you sort of go about knowing what to expect against this international competition this time around? Because I think when we spoke at pre, it was sort of like that's another race where uh, you know you you've gotten exposure to seeing the best and when they kick and make those moves. And I feel like this time around, you were in contention a bit longer than than last year, and it ended up leading to you finishing ninth compared to what you did last year. And so uh, there must have been some change, right? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just confidence. Um, just knowing that, like, my training was going well, and every like all my preparations have been nearly like perfect. Like every workout's been great, um, and just knowing that at some point you just need to believe that you can run with anyone. And so, like, it's not like you can do one workout and just all of a sudden think that you're going to be able to run with the best in the world. It's just a matter of putting yourself in there time and time again. And so. I look back now and I wish, like, I really want to run the 5K. I really wish I was doing the 5K here. But then I look back and going to Oslo and running against that international field was the best thing for my confidence. Um, running with some of those top Ethiopians right down to the wire, like, really showed me that, you know, like, some, like one of them, like, Wale is a 724 3K runner. And, like, these guys are, like, world medalists. And so just being able to, like, kick with them and compete gave me a lot of confidence going into the race um, this weekend that... I just need to put myself up there and realize like you're never going to run with these people if you don't try. And so I just, for as long as I could, I just tried. Um, and I made it to 9,200 meters and that's, you know, like a good, so for much of that 10 K I was right up there. Um, but now I have a year to like think, how can I be there at the bell? How can I be there with 200 to go in Budapest? So uh, you, you, we spoke in the mix zone after. First off, you, you were wearing a towel for the whole interview over your head. <laughs> it was a good look. <laughs> Speak on that. Um, <laughs> it must have been hot out there. Yeah, it was. I think the fans were a lot hotter than the runners. Like everyone was just mentioning how warm it was. Um, I think it was like 72 degrees, but the UV index was like eight. And so it was very sunny, which I'm surprised more people didn't have sunglasses on. Um, when I rolled up, I was. <laughs> I shout sunglasses. out. Are you yeah, shout No free ad. Yeah. No, you can shout out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But it was warm. I've done a lot of preparation for the heat. I mean, after Tokyo, I, I put a sauna in my basement because I was like, I, I need to be ready for the heat. I just boiled out in Tokyo. And so um, I felt really prepared for the heat. So I didn't think about it too much. It was definitely a factor, but it wasn't like the limiting factor in the race for me, um, which I think is how you want it to be when it's hot. You want to be able to manage the conditions uh, better than the others. And so I think that I did. Um, but yeah, then afterwards, yeah, the, like it set in and I had... I definitely was very warm after the race, and that towel on my head was very nice. <laughs> this is a question, I guess, for both of you guys. Marathon and 10K. So people think about kicking, and it's like, oh, I got to work on my speed, right? And it's like in the marathon and even the 10K, it's not really a speed thing, right? It's like, no, you have to get stronger and stronger, and then that way you can really unleash at the end. Yeah, I can't speak for the 10K, but um, I <laughs> yeah, NCAA do NCAA champ, you can speak for the 10K. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, back in the day, I did a lot of sprint stuff. But, like, I mean, it, when you're in the championship races, that speed matters, definitely. Um, but, like, when you're trying to get to the point where you're, you know, with, like, one to two laps to go, you have to make sure you're in the race still. So, like, you have to do the strength stuff in order to get to that point where you focus on speed. So mm -hmm. that's my experience. Yeah, I would say, like, right when I started working with Dathan, we, that first like six months, we did a lot of speed. I was doing a lot of stuff with Ollie and it just wasn't really translating into racing. And so I think that Dathan and I have learned that for me, I think I kind of just have like some good natural speed and doing all this like speed work isn't really helping 
with it. What I really need to work on is kind of with like K to go and three laps to go is oftentimes when I'll lose touch of those, the lead pack or something or the, of the race. And, um, I need to work on being able to be there three laps, two laps to go. Cause when it comes to the last 200, I'm, I usually am able to muster something up and I don't need to like really practice it. But like, uh, yesterday or two days ago, you know, it was with 800 to go. I just was let a gap form. And I knew if I could have closed that, like when I look back at the race, I'm just so like, it's so hard to watch because I knew if I could have closed it and been there with that group of, um, eight people with, uh, a lap to go, I know I wouldn't have been at ninth place. I know I could have beaten some of them. And so that's hard, um, to, to see, but I just, that's working on the strength, you know, doing the strength. It's not really speed at that point. I need to, you need to be able to be there. I, I asked this to Sean because, you know, he at some point got disconnected from, from the lead pack as well. And, you know, we get to see how close Grant is to the medals. Like, were, was that something that you kind of peeked at the Jumbotron a couple of times and, and also picked up on? Or were you just still, you know, gritting it through and focused on yourself? Yeah, I was I definitely had no clue what was going on up ahead. When uh, when I did get disconnected, I noticed that there were two runners in front of me that were also kind of falling mm-hmm. back as well. And at that point, my whole focus was just to beat those two runners, which I did. And so I was really happy with how I fought over the last 800 meters. But yeah, I didn't know what was going on up front. But then I just see the videos of that last 200 meters, and I just think how fun it would have been to be able to compete over that final stretch. Because in Oslo, man, that was like just like euphoric, you know, to be able to kick down the home stretch and like just put it all out there and see what you can do. And so to not be in there, you know, that's really motivating me to like get in shape next year to be able to be there with 200 to go. Is there an element of experience that comes into play here? Like the more you do it, like, is there any aspect for, and this is more specifically for those who have never done it before, like being a team USA at an event like this, even if it's in Eugene, it's not your normal race preparation. It's not the normal stuff leading in. Is there anything that's surprising that, you know, the more you do it, the more you're ready for it? Yeah, I would say that the, the biggest thing is, um, like being ready to like, People always think, you know, like, oh, the last 400 meters is going to be fast, but every race is different. Like this race with 800 meters to go, it was like, it was the matter of like 50 meters where the race just broke open. And so I think that having that experience and just being like comfortable, just covering those moves, I think that the more of races you're in and see that happen, you can gain um, experience to be able to cover those moves. Because yeah, like it's not just the last 200 meters, the last 400 meters. It's like, you don't know when it's going to happen. You just got to be ready to cover it. So now this is our ongoing question that we've decided we'll have to ask every athlete. What'd you do after the race? <laughs> oh, what did what did I do after the race? I got a massage. Oh, uh, that works really well. We hear. Yeah. Um, I honestly don't remember. The last couple of days have been kind of a blur. Like been very busy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I didn't celebrate too hard just because I was like, I mean, it was like very like it was a good day, but it wasn't like so much. I was just like ready to end the season, happy. You know, it's like it left me very hungry for like these next couple months of racing immediately right back in it are you on a plane to another race soon or what's your plan yeah so i'm back to boulder tomorrow to train for a bit um and then i'm not into monaco diamond league but i have a plane ticket there and i'm going there no matter what and so i've heard that i actually (laughs) um show up (laughs) no that's that's worked and mac probably knows who i'm talking about i know an athlete who showed up at the monaco Diamond League and just said, I'm here if you need me. Yeah. <laughs> and then they put him on the line at the, the on that day and he ran a personal best. Yeah. Wow. So, and then it works. Ray, Ray was, uh, he said he saw the Monaco uh, race director the other day and told him I had a ticket and he said he liked the confidence. So maybe I'll get confirmed before, the, the, like, before I fly over there. But uh, yeah, it was like actually earlier this season, I was trying to get into the Rome Diamond League and 36 hours before they said, hey, you got a spot on the line. And I had like literally just finished my hardest workout before Oslo. And I was like, well, it doesn't help me. (laughs) Like I can't, I can't, like I was already in Switzerland, but I was like, just cooked, you know, I needed to like, if I would have known 12 hours earlier, I probably could have (laughs) raced. You've also got a wedding to throw into your schedule at some point, right? Yeah. uh, October 15th. So 16th. That's like the (laughs) runner wedding, like September, October, (laughs) you know, everyone's like ready to go. It's in that off season for at least the track athletes. Mm -hmm. 
So good, good date call. What's your claim to fame? It's like uh, you have the most sub four minute miles. I had at your so wedding. many sub four minute milers at my wedding. So also, my claim to fame is I swear no one has more sub four minute milers in their phone book than me. I have like <laughs> okay. two hundred something now, and I think you know we keep asking people to come on the show. That's helping. Is there gonna be like a live coffee club set up at outside your wedding where they interview all the, like the guests that'd be pretty good i bet i could set it up with ollie and i bet they'd be all for it um we do have a <laughs> lot invited, of invited huh a lot of run- oh yeah 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 yeah. they got the invite uh huh, lot- we didn't the whole yeah a lot of runners would be there um but it's funny because yeah we i wanted the wedding after the season because i did not want to think about it but coincidentally sage his parents and my parents like they're eight years apart but they got married on the same day june 27th oh. and before i knew the 10k was going to be in may like the trials, she was like, oh, like we should do our wedding uh, like on June 27th. And that was like the day after the 800 final. And like, I'm just like, no, this is just logistically terrible. Like June 27th is probably the worst week of the year to try and put a wedding. It's, so It's good to see you getting involved in the wedding planning. Yeah, my, my wedding <laughs> yeah. planning was just pushing it to October. <laughs> Mine was forcing the open bar. Okay. <laughs> so I got married and not, this has nothing to do with you guys or anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is my show. Uh, <laughs> um, so we got married in Ireland and in Ireland it's like cash bars. And I was like, there's no way we're making a hundred Americans come over <laughs> to Ireland and then making them do a cash bar. And everyone was like, no, Kylie, I'm telling you, you can't do an open bar in Ireland. <laughs> They'll take advantage of you. And I was like, we're doing an open bar, I promise you. And that was my one major contribution. And then the second all the Irish, you know, lads came and found out that it was an open bar, it was a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> That's the move right there. Um, <laughs> So, all right. So that, are you busy with that? Is that like a good distraction right now? The planning? Yeah. My only part of the planning is just kind of expanding the guest list. Like, uh, <laughs> every day I'm like, oh, I'm going to invite this person and this person and this person. And so it's just so like, helpful. Like all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're kind of pushing the maximum capacity at the venue now. And like, initially we were thinking of just doing like a really small wedding, like just our family, but my family's huge. And so just my family is probably like 60 people. And yeah, so the, that's my contribution. Just think of who we need to invite. <laughs> yeah, what is that morning run? I guess the day of the wedding. Well, like? yeah. yeah, the mo- day of is really fun because all your friends are there. And then my wife and I did a hour run together the morning after, and that really threw people for a loop. Also, <laughs> I think Ray Flynn is still here, and I'm like mortified at the idea that he just heard me do an Irish accent. So I, <laughs> I thought it sounded great. Yeah, you thought it was good. <laughs> well, here's a practice. Yeah. Our, here's our a wedding practice. venue is right on a trail that we <laughs> would run in uh, college. So I, people, like if they have to leave their car there, they can literally run up there the next morning and That's, get their car. The it's, logistical it's, side of things. Logistical That's is great. Yeah, yeah, it's like four, three, four miles up the canyon, Boulder Canyon. So I heard uh, Sage's interview with David uh, Melly, and uh, he asked her, he's like, oh, what's the venue? Is it the CU indoor track? Oh, no, probably not. <laughs> Can't get on I, that. I hear that's hard to get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Were you invited to be a co-host on Coffee Club and like... You decided you didn't want to be, you just wanted to be an occasional guest or like, how did that go So on? Were you just like not there that so day? No, no, no. So I, so, so I don't live with them and I heard they're making a podcast and they just kind of started rolling with it. And then I think now it's kind of good I'm not on it because Morgan keeps telling me how much people want me to be on it. And so when I do go on it, I think, I think they get good numbers on their listens. And so uh, that, the numbies again, I, exactly. We so, are well so aware I, I of the clicker bump. Yeah, I, I think it's good that some of us aren't on it because like, you know, then then it just keeps people like wanting, you know, like, oh, get, they need to get them on, they need to get them on. And they waited like months before they put me on because I didn't want to ask. I was like, you know, they have a good thing going. They have a good following. I didn't want to like intrude on their podcast. But yeah, I was pretty. You don't want to be associated. <laughs> no, no, I want to be responsible. I, I, I would love to be like. Corporate's yeah. not coming down on yeah, you. No, no. I like, I love being on it. But yeah, I think. Uh, I, 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 they have, Morgan is like the brains of like content, like his YouTube and his like podcasts. Like, so I don't, I don't want to infringe on his, you know, creative, his creative freedom. You know, you guys keep coming over here using our coffee machine and I haven't seen any coffee club beans. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something to ask probably Ollie. So you're washing your hands of it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. yeah. On you. Exactly. <laughs> I, then I don't have to be associated. With, I mean, I hear they get some backlash for some of the. I don't listen to all the podcasts, but I hear they say some pretty controversial things. So now I don't have to be associated with it. <laughs> yeah, you, you broke it down. How did you break it down? Yeah, it's like Ollie just has 
the hot takes, like <laughs> the absolute wild card. Morgan is like, you know, he's I, the quarterback. I, he's the quarterback. He keeps the show he's moving the, along. Yeah, yeah, he's he's definitely in charge, and I I think he has a high running IQ, and it really comes out in the show. And then Jordy just plays the role of like what I'm feeling <laughs> at different moments moment. listening to them. It's like, do you listen? Yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes it's just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you, it's, that's why I like watching the YouTube videos. It's a good mix of, yeah. of yeah, personalities there. So, um, and then you bring the numbies. Yeah. Yeah. Bring in the new, the new listeners. So actually, I wanted to pick your brain about one more thing. It was uh, Joe Fonbele. Do you have any good stories of him in, in it from high school? Yeah, it's pretty funny, actually. Um, so I was maybe a senior when he was a seventh grader, or maybe he's an eighth grader. Oh, wow, I didn't realize the age Yeah, 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 a okay. bit of an age gap. But I was, uh, like, upperclassman on the cross-country team. And at Hopkins, the junior high goes with the varsity. So, like, we're very close and, like, kind of mentor the younger guys. And I remember when he was, like, he joined the cross-country team and, like, very very unathletic like a great guy, kick. but great like like great energy like was just like the life of that team and at that point you know a lot of people they could go up for cross country they don't know much about running but it was like super cool to see him just like lead that team and like really like bring out the best in people and then a couple years later um i came back for the section track meet and i'm watching the 200 and this guy just from hopkins just flies wins by like probably 20 meters and I, I go to one of the assistant coaches who I know pretty well. I'm like, yeah, like, who, who is that? Like, how do I not know who this guy is? Like, he's so fast. I'm like, oh, that's Joe Fombola. I'm like, no. Like, <laughs> he's a head taller. He's, like, cut. Like, just, like, the most athletic. Obviously, like, you see him now. He's just so athletic looking. And I was like, I literally cannot believe this is the same guy. Um, but then he continued to go out for cross country every year. He was a captain on the cross country team. And, like, he's a big, big distance running fan. And... Um, so yeah, I keep I keep I keep telling the people at on. I'm like, you need this guy. Like you you could brand him with OAC. I mean, he I heard he was like on the cross country team going running like five, six miles sometimes. So like he he fits the bill, you know? Oh, so you're petitioning on to tap into the sprinter market. Oh, I well, love even it. more because they have Chloe Abbott. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like uh, expanding it because he you know he has a distance background. So like <laughs> yeah. it you know fits the brand pretty well. I love that. Should we, should we, uh, maybe swap better? Yeah. I know he's got a busy schedule and he's taking off today. Um, but before we move on to some of our guests who are hopefully drinking Modelo's in the corner right now, <laughs> do you guys have anything positive to say about Sidious Mag? Oh, what, what can we say? <laughs> Look into the camera. Like, <laughs> Look into the camera. <laughs> say one? some positive things. Joe, I know. No, I've, I've, Citrus I've, Mag. Yeah, you can call Citrus it. Mag. Hey, no, 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 no. I respect <laughs> it. I, I, I'm not, I'm not the nickname guy like Ollie, but no, I would say the coolest thing has been seeing the, the guests that you've had on the show so far. Like, I love seeing the, the list every day of who you get on the show. I'm just like, it's pretty cool that like you guys have this set up and you're getting like literally the best athletes from all over the world to come and sit down and chat. And I think it's just great to highlight again, like we're saying with the brands and the sponsors, like the news outlets. It's like really highlighting the people individually. And so that's been cool for me to see. Yeah. You can, you're the appetizer for Seb Co. How's that feel? I'm, like, also, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also going to cut out the part where I asked you to say something. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut that out. <laughs> oh, it's been so cool to see you guys grow. Like just seeing where you guys came from and just like how small it was Flow in track intern yes, yeah exactly, wow. exactly. Yeah. and like you guys are just so chill and like you're just so authentic and like you know like <laughs> <laughs> i like that it's not just distance running too yeah yeah, Be yeah. because after are my you a big throws guy well no so after my now? 10k i was doing my victory lap and i kid you not the most excited person on the whole victory lap was raven saunders like <laughs> running down and i was like i maybe talked to you like one time in tokyo but she was like just ecstatic and i was like that's pretty cool, and I know like you guys do a lot with the throws. Like, did you see Raven life. pick me up? Did you see? That I, I didn't. I didn't see it. She but picked me up I believe over it. her head. I swear, I haven't picked up, been picked up like that since I was a baby. And yeah. then you got picked up, yeah, by uh, Joe Kovac. Yeah, <laughs> but who's gonna pick us up? Yeah. Oh up? man, RG three will. Yeah, <laughs> RG three is gonna pick you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Jazz is picking yeah, but, you up. <laughs> but that's been really cool because like, just like integrating throws, distance, sprints, like it's all all track and field and promoting it all. I think is cool because like. Sometimes you just see distance runners promoted in certain outlets, sprinters in certain outlets, but like putting it all together is cool. Well, th that's the point that I always try to make. And well, that it's not rocket science. <laughs> no, no, it's just <laughs> as we, as, oh, well, let's grow the sport, let's expand. And it's like, well, let's start first with the people who are already in the stadium, mm -hmm. like who are already watching. And if we can get this event group to cheer for that event group, then then let's start looking beyond. Mm -hmm. So, um, but before you go, you guys have to sign the flag. We were oh, reminded yeah, in the group right. chat. 
looking at this. Look at these names. I don't know what we're going to do shirt. with this flag eventually. It's, it's going to my office in is New it? York. Yeah. We have an office? Yeah. Matt, <laughs> did you know we have an office? <laughs> no. I think it's just Chris's it's apartment. It's just the <laughs> side bedroom, yeah. Do you care where we sign? No, no, that's up to you. I'm definitely signing in gold. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah go, go for it. She's the bronze. You okay, and yeah. Ashton right. Eaton are signing in gold. I will sign next to Ashton Eaton. Yeah, Ashton's coming up. Are we doing... The Ashton interview is going to come on later in this in this show. Um... So, you know, what's going to be really funny is I think we're, we're going to get RG3 on, yeah. and I think Marvin and Trayvon are going to crash the party. Oh, that's going to be a cool so conversation. I hope, I hope that... I don't Ar even know if you knew that they were coming. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So they're, they're, they're going to make their way. Marvin texted me and said he was running a little bit late, and so... Um, What's that? Divas. You got. You were early. You, yeah, you were early. I, know. Yeah. I, don't want to I live right there. So. Yeah, yeah, you're we're right not impressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll give him that. Well, thanks so much, and um, Joe. Thank you yeah, so this much. Was this was awesome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I appreciate Seriously. it. I don't know if you're running yet. You know, group run eight thirty tomorrow morning, Washburn Park, Joe. You can Come lead by. the six minute group. Yeah, I'll be running. I'll, I'll be. I'll be running around uh, Eugene tomorrow. So I'll probably see you out there. See you at eight thirty. Yeah. yeah. All right. I get All my right. week off. So. Yeah. No. You. You do your thing. Go to Agate Alley. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. And now we're going to bring on Heisman Trophy winner. That's a very interesting introduction. Yeah, our <laughs> first Heisman Trophy winner <laughs> of the week. Yeah. Uh, NFL quarterback, ESPN broadcast star. Track field fan and advocate and ambassador, I would say, now at that. At, you know, that's kind of the new role. Robert Griffin III, welcome to the show. Thank you, brother. Thank you. How you guys doing? Good. I'm glad I'm not sitting next to you. We had a photo that just has, is going viral of us <laughs> sitting next to uh, Josh Awatunde. And oh, wow. He, is, oh, yeah. he makes us look absolutely tiny. Um, and I believe if I sat there, that's that's going to be yeah. the case. So we'll have Marvin sit there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, First guy to come in through the backyard. Yeah. I didn't even know that that fence opened up. Uh, I didn't either. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, go for it. Emma's bag is somewhere. There. I just assumed that was oh, Robert. There it is. There you go. You know this is live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, this is live. Yeah, All right. yeah. And yeah, we got a couple hundred people watching right now. Yeah, more than that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Robert, I mean, you're out here as a fan. I'm rocking the Estonia. Uh, national like, you saw that. that I saw that yes yeah, so my wife is Estonian she uh, ran track and field at Florida State uh, heptathlon record holder there Very so cool. uh, USA track and field wouldn't give me a, a jacket <laughs> so I decided to rock the Estonian gear we'll talk to them we, yeah we gotta we gotta have that conversation so was sure. there I mean we just saw a Florida Gator do quite well in the heptathlon is there like a rivalry there how do we feel about that well uh, <laughs> wifey's over there saying there is no rivalry and <laughs> Hall, you know amazing job and we were there you know to watch that and to see her go out there get a massive PB in the hep and, and get the uh, bronze medal uh, was just cool to see, and then Theum, right? Yeah, another massive PB in the eight by like I don't know, like ten seconds or something mm -hmm. to run two thirteen to win the gold. Um, you know, the track and field athletes just never cease to amaze me. So when ESPN brought you on to commentate at NCAA's, then afterwards we had a whole conversation about how I mean, you knocked it out of the park. It was so well received, and it's sort of like now let, let let's keep. Robert Griffin in track and field <laughs> so that he can do more of this stuff. And so uh, since that conversation, I mean, you, you managed to, to get out here also kind of uh, to cheer on, yep. uh, you know, athletes. So uh, how has the track and field sort of the conversations in the community been since sort of since NCAA is, I mean, it's been a, a month since then. Well, Chris, first of all, you know, I, we talked about this. Mm -hmm. uh, ESPN did not approach me uh, yeah. about track. I approached really? them. I um, it didn't. was one of those deals where, there's not a, a ton of money in track and field in the broadcasting space. So uh, this is a passion project for me. Um, I reached out to him. I asked him if I could do. I didn't say, hey, can I do NCAAs? Uh, that would be a little little odd. I just if you said, ever need me. Yes. I was like, hey, can I can I do some track and field broadcasting? You know, I ran, um, you know, kind of ran pro. Oh, are we, when are it we crashing? Oh. We're crashing. Oh. I think oh. we're just crashing. Oh. Oh. No, introduction. no introduction. No introduction. No introduction. He's in. here. Come in. Right. The bullet. <laughs> You brought, I hope you brought enough cookies and Red Bull for everyone. Yeah, cookies in. I got oatmeal raisin. I got my oatmeal raisin cookies. <laughs> Bringing a pack oh like God. that with the name on it. There it is. All right, All right, I was we'll gonna pick up that We're going to pick that conversation yeah. up yeah. later. <laughs> my man. Mm -hmm. So proud of you, bro. Appreciate it, man. He already know. We know the story. We all know the story of everything you've been through. Oh, yeah. So talk to the people, man. 
Uh, it's been a long journey. Um, uh, you know, seven years since my last hundred meter championship. Uh, six years since my medal in general uh, in 2016 at World Indoor. So to be able to come back, uh, representing a big way uh, for myself, my family, uh, the brand New Balance, it was big. So and I'm glad to do it on home soil. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What have you been up to since we saw you last? Oh uh, man, I, I really just been chilling, honestly, like soaking it all in. But I still got to practice because we know we got the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. um, then obviously we got to go through these last couple of days, figure out what we're doing with the relay. So I still got to keep my head in the game, you know. So I had kind of that one day uh, after the 100 to just kind of celebrate. Uh, but What'd you do? What'd you do? Can't say. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's how you know it was yeah. good. Yeah. It went down. Josh Tunde said he it was at Denny's down. getting lit. I said practice the next day. I felt good. And I looked oh. good. There you go. Right. Sometimes so, that happens. Be like that. It's sometimes like you that. feel really good. A medal good. will do that for you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I don't feel nothing. Everybody feel great. <laughs> so, so, Trayvon, uh, I mean, the, your phone must have blown up right afterwards. Like, what has there been any one particular person that reached out to you or anything that really stood out to you from the reception of everyone kind of really celebrating this moment with you? Man, so a lot of people don't know, like I was on social media for, for a couple right. of weeks, you know, going from, you know, Eugene with the with the USA trials and then obviously up into making the podium, I was on social media. So coming back to it, I had a lot of DMs because a lot of people didn't, like who don't know, my birthday had already passed as well. So mm. I had all the happy birthday stuff, and then obviously with the with the world medal and stuff, it was it was crazy. And then so many text messages. I had over like a hundred messages on my phone, and probably like two, three hundred on like my social media. So it it was crazy. And I I want to say in my message request, I had like two hundred. So it was it was wild. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, was there anyone that you like people you haven't heard from? that maybe you didn't know were cheering for you these last few years, probably, you know, so happy for you, so proud. Oh, uh, I had a couple, like, like NFL guys, uh, NBA guys. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is, this is my brother. We family, so. <laughs> uh, uh, I had, you know, uh, Bolt reached out, you know, talked to him, too. So, wow. yeah, like, it's a couple people, man, a couple big names, and I appreciate them, you know, for backing me up and showing the love that they did. So we talked a little bit in the mix zone about just sort of that, Embrace with Marvin right after the finish line. You both yeah. hit the track, and I hit the track. You hit the track. Yeah, <laughs> I got tackled. <laughs> yeah, let, let me put that on record. That was a flag. Just, just in case flag I get the I love the text <laughs> message that, that you said. Yeah. What was the text love. after? Oh. You know, his sore subject. So, yeah, he talking about something. He gonna tell his people that uh, he swung on me, but he gonna, <laughs> that, that ain't happening. That, that ain't happening. Those black Air Force ones. <laughs> How good did that victory lap feel? Man, it felt good. Um, obviously. Being with those two guys as well, you know, they're my boys. So to be able to, you know, deal with what we all have dealt with, you know, to be able to go and do what we did on home soil, it was crazy. Like the the crowd showing the love that they did, you can't reenact the feeling. You know, it, it's that once in a lifetime opportunity, and to be able to seize that moment is it's a blessing. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say like the you know the the craziest thing, and I talked about it on social because um, like Trayvon said, we're we're family, like. I've been there with, with Trey from day one when he was at Baylor, when he was going through all the injuries. So I felt like it was really important in that moment to kind of highlight that portion of it because, you know, sometimes people don't understand that part of the story. We know Fred was a 400 runner, right? Dropped down to the 100, boom, doing crazy things. But what Trey went through and what Marvin went through chasing his NFL dream, I felt like that story hadn't been told enough and there wasn't enough time to, to tell those those types of stories. So for him to go through everything that he went through, because I saw it firsthand, you know, this wasn't something where like when Trey was doing great, we were talking and when he yeah. wasn't talking, when he wasn't doing great, we weren't talking. I was with him in the trenches talking yeah. about all this different stuff, even talking about my man from Ireland yeah. with the board, with the speed boards and everything. Like we've been yeah. talking for a long time. Yeah. And so for him to- What was that? You know, <laughs> it's been a journey, man. It's been a journey, it's listen. A journey. So just trying to find different ways to like, uh, help each other get better at our craft and, and do certain things. So um, for him to come up come up and do what he did, obviously I know he wanted to win. Yeah. But when you win a medal, medal at the world stage after all the years, and I mean, what was it, three? I think it was three races in three years due yeah. to injury. Like, that's the story that needs to be told. People have to understand you can do anything as long as you apply yourself to it because yeah. the many people have written him off after those three years. So for him to come back and do that, I thought was beyond special. And I know he won't say it because he's, he, this is my guy, super humble, but I'm gonna say it for him. It's unbelievable that he was able to come back and do what he did. It feels like there should be a 30 for 30 or something on the three of you guys. Like that was one of the most special moments I've ever been in a stadium and track field yep. for. Like that was, I mean, 
when when all three of your names popped up on the screen, I posted a video. Like yeah. the crowd went insane. Can you think of a better moment that you've been live for? I mean, for, that's probably is it a career highlight? Man, I, like I was talking about this the other day with a couple of people. For me, this is like probably the greatest medal I would ever receive in the sense of meaningful. Like if I go and win gold, which that's what I plan to do in the future to come. Yes, I'm gonna be happy for winning gold. But this one meant a lot because, like you said, it's a 30 for 30 movie type moment. Yes. I was written off after those years. Even for myself mentally, I didn't know if I wanted to come back, if I thought I would come back. Then even coming back and still not performing the way I wanted to and then to be able to finally get on the podium, it, it, was, it was surreal to me. You know, so to be able to do those things where, where a lot of people probably would have gave up. Right, like it's not too many people that have had the situation that I had from injuries to be able to keep persevering. Think about it; my injuries have been happening since I was in high school, middle school in 2008. Now we're in 2022, so let me remind you that was years of injury in my life. Yeah, a lot of people would have been gave up. So the 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 drive of perseverance and strength, mentally and physically, that I hope to show the world, you like I said, you can't find a better author for this. We spoke about this indoors, your co-host on our New Balance Indoor Nationals coverage of After the Final Lap. Maybe you might want to talk to him about that career later. You're pretty good at it. <laughs> well, you're, you're really <laughs> good. He's, he's ready to go now. <laughs> no, no. So we we spoke a little about, uh, you know, New Balance was fully behind you in those yep. years. And you, you, you can tell the number if you want, but like you spent a lot of money and time and effort in trying to get your, you know, your legs right. Definitely. I mean, I mean shoot. My agent would know the number as well because we were setting up the flights and all the bookings, man. It's, it's expensive when you're trying to delegate through trying to get back from these type of injuries. Like, you know, remind you, like it's Achilles injury, so it's, it's, it's very keen. Like, it's hard to repair that, get that thing back going, as well as trying to build back definition in the areas around it. So that takes a lot of money when flying to Germany, Ireland, you know, coast to coast in the United States, and then seeing doctors and their rates. Like, it's expensive. You know, but that was a a risk, not a risk, but that was one of those things that I was willing to do to get back to the thing that I love, right? And even in some of those moments, things did not look well. Like, I could be completely honest with you. A lot of those doctors was like, it ain't happening. Like, he's not coming back. You know, I've said it. I said it the other day in the interview. Even the coach that I'm with now with uh, the doctor that we seen, he texted him. He said, from his numbers, from his tests, he's not going to be back running. I got the text messages myself. Like, you know, I, I've seen them. And it's crazy to see that now we're sitting in this moment. Even he texted me. He was just like, wow. You know, from not only just getting the medal, but the times that I ran. Like That first medal, you know, you things were a little easier back then. Yeah. You know, and I, I think of this from my own personal, and I didn't come back and win a medal. But after I was injured for a year and I had a major surgery, I remember I came back and the first time I broke four minutes in the mile again, I bawled crying. I came in last in the race. And it, it's like not every race is just how fast you run yeah. or what you win, but they're more meaningful for different reasons. So I really yeah. appreciate you sharing like just how special this is. And the more that we talk about it, you know, I hope that gets out to other people because there's so many people right now, right now who are lost and they're looking around and they're trying to find the right doctor who can help yeah. them. Right. So what kept you going at that point? Man, people around me, I always say it's a village, man. You you can't do it by yourself. I don't care who you think you is. Nobody on this planet is Superman. You know, you got to have a great community of people around you. And once again, I think that's what makes the moment meaningful. Because like, just like the story you told, like I, I had the same exact story. Like 2020, right, right before my you know my coach that grew up coaching me died. Like, I, let's remember in 2019, I ran 10-5. Twice, yep. you know what I'm saying? Yep. Now, now imagine I was a nine-eight sprinter when I left, and I come back and I run ten-five. That's Chris times. Yeah, you know. What <laughs> oh <I'm saying>? my <laughs> god! You feel me? So uh, I wish. It, it's like think about it like this, and then you tell me like I, I get in this new group, and then I go and run ten flat for my first race. Like I, I was on the gate, shaking the gate, like because I was just like, yo, this can't be happening. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm really coming back. So like to have a community of people around me, like. Shoot, my agent is like my best friend in this whole situation because he stayed he stayed by my side through this whole thing. Well, once again, like, I had a lot of people give up on me. And it started back, you know, in adolescence time from as a child, even coming up through college. Like a lot of colleges backed away from me because things right. got bad, grades and all that. So to have somebody like him as well to be on my side, be like, hey, we're going to find a way, we're going to find a way. Having my family, we're going to find a way. Having New Balance, like, look, we ain't giving up on you. Friends, like, all that stuff helped because if you were like a man by yourself, 
it ain't gonna work. You're gonna crack and fold every time. Like, I don't care how strong you think you are. Life is stronger. Like, the concrete is always stronger than what you think you are. So, for me, it's always the family behind, you know, the person. So, Robert, I mean, like, what, what kind of, like, parallels do you think you draw from Trayvon's story to, to your own career? But then at the yeah. same time, like, there's, you know, in coming out of this week, and we're here in track town as, like, this is a track and field bubble. Like, every, everywhere you go, there's a track fan, and you can run into them, and everyone is hyped up about this right. story. But Trayvon's story in particular needs to get out to more people, 100%. right? On on all the mainstream sports networks yep. and, on, and, and, and more major news outlets, and... In a way, people root for for that comeback, and it, it's when people see them at their lows, and now you know the highs. So you know you you know from the NFL that people love those kinds of stories. So how yep. can we you know package or even get Trayvon's story out there to more people? Because you know that's another thing that not only benefits Trayvon and you know his marketability as an athlete and everything, but for the sport in general that people can see those stories yeah well i'll answer that question first before the one about the parallels between my career so i got i have a meeting with netflix in the next couple of days so with your blessing I'll, I'll take that to to them and and uh and try to you know bring you guys along with so we can do that to try to tell trayvon's story <laughs> yeah Why that's right getting in these meetings that's right all right so <laughs> no nah, i mean because I, I, I truly believe in that that's the only reason like i'm doing it trey knows like we well, i think that the last time we saw each other was at the baylor game yeah, yeah, yeah. right before i went out and ran yeah. with the baylor line he was like you sure you're gonna run i'm like i'm gonna run we're gonna get this done <laughs> but um no nah, i think that's a his story fred's story marvin's story that's something that you could easily package together. So, uh, you know, my wife is going to hold me accountable to that, to remember, to bring that up to Netflix when I have that meeting, because uh, that's a it's it's not something that you just want to do uh, really quickly. Right. It's something that you want to make sure you get the right time. So everything because right now he's still in competition mode. It's not like over, he's too. About. Like the story and it's still not being over. Written. The story's still been being written. So how can we package that together the right way to tell it in a in a, a meaningful way? And I think the bigger the audience, the better the story is going to be because people are interested mm-hmm. in that type of stuff. So um, I think the fact that he came back and won a medal definitely helps the case. Yeah. Right. And then the American sweep in the hundred. And if you guys go out and do your thing in the form of 100 and get that thing around the track, <laughs> right, it's only going to continue to add to that story. So that's something that, that I definitely want to want to be a part of if you'll give me that blessing to do that. Yeah, for sure. And then when it comes to, like, for myself, like, this is a thing that people have to understand that that aren't your 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 track and field lifers. Trayvon got hurt and has a, had an Achilles injury, and it's not like the 100 meters is a finesse sport or a finesse event, right? It's a violent event. If you ever watch him run, it's some of the most violent running I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> right? Everything. Trying to get down that track as fast as you possibly you're smooth. can. Don't worry. You're smooth. He's smooth. <laughs> He's smooth with it. But yeah, it's, it's a, a violent. It's a lot of force. And it's a lot it's of a lot force. force into the ground. Right. It's a lot of force into the ground. So when you talk about a, a, a foot, ankle type injury, that's something that people can't shy away from. And we talked about this. People think that track and field athletes are, are, are soft in a, in a certain sense. And that's not the case. Right? Devin Allen didn't stop playing football because he was afraid to get hit. He stopped playing football because he tore his ACL twice and then realized he could probably have a career as a 110 hurdler uh, as opposed to what they're going to tell him when it comes to being on the football field. So for me, when I got injured, um, football is a sport that you have to rely on 10 other guys. right? Track and field, you get out of it what you put in. And I think the parallel that I, I draw the most with Trayvon is – when you put in so much effort and so much work and you don't see the results, it is it just kills you on the inside. And I think he went through that for about three, four years where you're like, man, I'm a 9-8 guy. I come back. Now I'm a 10-5 guy, but I'm putting in the work. I know I'm doing what, what coach is telling me to do. I'm doing the extra stuff. I'm doing what the doctor's telling me to do, and I'm trying to overcome all these things. And I faced that in my NFL career to the point where I was out of football in 2017. I'm sitting there throwing at, you know, pineapple trees and, and, and whatnot, trying to figure out, like, why am I not in the league? I'm 27. What's going on here? Mm-hmm. So I got back in at 28, and I had to make a decision to take a lesser role uh, and go back up Lamar Jackson in Baltimore, but pay it forward in a way to give to a guy that didn't – so he would have something I didn't when I got in the league. So I took pride in that part of it. But I always knew, like – this is something I'll say it on here since I won't get a chance to be on the NBC broadcast for the four and the hurdles um, for various reasons. Um, <laughs> we'll get into that later, maybe. You can but, speak uh, on that whenever you want. <laughs> okay, I know you want that. I know you want that. Uh, I'll, I'm a firm believer that whenever you step out on the track, you're not, it's, not, it's not for play, right? There's no games there. 
And because it's just you on the track, no one's coming to save you. Right? When you step in that lane, you're in lane three, four, five, or you're in lane eight, eight right? Mm. It's you in lane eight. The coach ain't coming to help you get a boost. He can't step on the blocks for you, right? Your friend can't tag off in the middle and, and go run the rest of the race. It's you and all those other guys in that event. And that's why I always believe that track and field is the only true sport. Everything else is just a game. Everything else is just a game. I love that. Can, that can, I, can cool. I piggyback off of that real quick? Yeah. Let me take a that's why you're here. Yeah, get your energy. And maybe pass over those cookies. At <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ain't nothing in them cookies, yeah, right? This is just oh. cookies, right? <laughs> NBC, I know NBC we're in Oregon. Right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, nah, I want to. We're I in wanna... this together, Chris. Uh, and you bake these yourself. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. NBC Chef did. You know, okay. I love them, but. I'll take I, I want to kind of piggyback off of that and and say, man, I want to kind of give some kudos to the crowd too, because as an individual sport, when you're going to run in like the hundred sprint all the way up into all the events, right? You got people in the crowd that's coming to see you cheer your own. Being here in the home stadium was a blessing. And for me, somebody, like I said, dealing with everything I've dealt with, even in this year, dealing with like critics and the naysayers, like it was a lot, like I never really got nervous in none of my races, but this one, the nerves cracked and hit me, you know, right going into that final because I'm thinking like, man, I don't want to let down my team. I don't want to let down, you know, my family again. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what rolling through my mind. But then, man, some of the people in the crowd right next to me, and I think it was a blessing being in lane eight. Like they was like, Trey, like you got it. Like I was hearing it. It was a guy like right next to me. He was like, <laughs> he's like, Trey, they always talking down on you. Show them right now. Show them. Oh, it was me. And it was me. That was real. me. I said that. I was like, yo. <laughs> All the nerves went away because I'm like, man, these people really believe in me. You know what I'm saying? Like, even after they they know what people saying, how like, you know, what critics feel like, oh, because he needs to show up and this and that. And like, the the how the crowd there to be able to still believe in you was mind blowing to me. And that all all the jitters, all the nervousness went away. And I was like, man, like you gotta show love to the crowd that come out and support you. I would say that uh, just to piggyback, cookie in the re, re piggyback you know, off of that. The cookie who's is writing, phenomenal, who's by the way. Back here, <laughs> but to see. Like when you watch meets, you don't see Americans get the the love that they've gotten here in Eugene on home soil. So it's kind of weird when you hear the guy from Jamaica or the you know the girl from Poland not really get the cheers that they would get on the European scene, uh, and the Americans are the ones getting that now. Yeah, it's nice. So I thought that was awesome. I think it's actually like you're saying it lifted up the the level at least the like the energy of the American runners to know that like they've got that crowd behind yeah. them. Uh, which is something that's been really cool to see. Yeah, for sure. You've been saying for months the advantage of the home field. Yeah, yeah. And that's you true. felt that, but I, I something that I'm just I want to. Yeah, whenever I've had a semi and then a final, we have a day in between, or you know, maybe 24 hours. How do you process? I mean, it seems like the idea of having a semifinal and then two hours later doing a final. It's just like you wake up that morning and you don't even know that you're in the main event yet. Man, it's with the hundred man. You don't know, like <laughs> imagine not knowing hits. you're in the Super Bowl that night. <laughs> no, 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 like, and then also the fact that just to throw this in there before you answered, yeah. like most of y'all ran unbelievable yeah. in the first round, mm -hmm. yeah. and then y'all came back in the semi, and it was like a little tougher to man, get those times I down. Talk about a, that for real. Too. Go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Look, tell so, us what you got. I, 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 the prelims was an interesting thing, and I think it was being on home soil, right? So, yeah. like, when they called our name, obviously being U.S., it was like, ah, like, and like, like Rob said, like, we never had that. So, like, like y'all see me at races, like, you know, I give, like, probably a wave, or, you know, I do my, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but it was hard for me not to smile and be turk. I'm like, <laughs> we don't ever get this, you know what I'm saying? So, I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's showtime. And I think that's why you've seen the time, because, like, I ran so relaxed. I'm like, oh, and I'm, like, shutting down. I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, oh, yeah, we finna go crazy. <laughs> we finna go crazy. And then when the sim, we wake up that next morning, the semi come, and you just, like, you know, you just wake up, do your little daily stuff, and, you know, we don't run into, like, five something. Like, I'm watching Netflix, chilling, playing the game. Then we get there, I'm just like, all right, you know, time to go. Then when you run in and you, you pass the time, like, I don't know what you're saying, but like, me and Fred had the same facial expression. Like, when right. I passed the line, I seen the time. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yo. I I'm said, telling I, you. I was like, please don't tell me somebody about to win with 10-0. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, please don't tell me. I said, this is not going to look good. I said, it's not going to look good being the slowest track meet ever. <laughs> so, when we seen the times, I'm like, all right. It's not looking too good. And then when the final come and, like, you all walk out and then you see the, the planes come through, you like, we really here. Like this is this is it, you know. So it, it, it's a crazy environment. Like like you said, it's like 
imagine waking up and be like, Super Bowl, here you go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, you know what I'm saying? Like the day before you didn't know, but now you're here. Right. right. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So I think Fred went viral on Twitter for, uh, I tweeted out the clip of him saying, someone had asked him, why'd you run so fast yeah. in the first round? Uh, a 9 7. And he said, because those other guys had to go to sleep thinking about that 9 7, and I didn't. But it doesn't seem to, like, you had other other dreams. The 9 7 didn't uh, pop into your head. <laughs> no, nah, yeah. Like, it, so it was funny. Like, it was crazy because when Marv went in the first heat, I, I laughed in my head because I was like, I want to see what he's going to do, right? So I was like, I, I want to see what he's going to run. So when he ran when he ran the 10, I was like, I was like, okay, okay. He slowed down, shut it down. Cool. We got through. Then with Fred, when he went 979, I said, okay. Okay. I said, all right. We putting on a show. Let's put on a show then. <laughs> so then when I got up to like 70, I was like, all right, I'm finna shut it down. And when I seen the time, I said, oh, yeah. I said, it's there. <laughs> I said, it's there. So like, I'm like, okay, the crowd know it ain't about to be no games when we come right. into these next few rounds. So I think it was a good setup for a good show. You know, it's just get to the finals, like, dog eat dog world, right? Uh-huh. Can you tell? So if, if you said to me, go run a 60 second 400, mm. no watch, I could probably get pretty damn close to running 60 second 400. When you go run, can you tell that you're running 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 10.0, or is it not until the time pops up that you know? So my speed surprises me, I'm gonna be honest. When I was running, I knew I was like running fast because like I, I could feel some of the separation in the race. Then when I shut it down, like, I mean, if you watch the video, I probably, like I said, I shut down probably about 15, 12 meters out. And I'm thinking like, okay, it's probably gonna be like a nine second run. Uh, then when I seen the time of the 9.89, I was like, I'm in shape. I'm in some good shape. So right. I'm like, okay, we're good to go, you know. So for me, it's it's hard to kind of really tell because, you know, like we said, like I'm, I'm a very smooth runner. So I don't, even though I'm small and I put out a lot of force, I don't physically feel it because of like I'm very, I'm a very te- technique runner. Like oh, yeah. obviously I'm not like a, a power runner like I'm a Makai Williams or a Coleman. Like I'm, I'm not, you know, big and stocky, right? So like I'm a smooth runner, you know. So when I get up to speed, I'm just floating down the track. Like to me, it's like I feel like I'm running slow until I see the time, you know. So it, it, it it's weird. It's a weird dynamic. He never looks like he's running slow. <laughs> Listen, I went. This is when you were still with Coach Ford. Remember, I came to track practice and I was uh, practicing with y'all inside. Yeah, yeah. We were running starts, and uh, you know I like to think I'm fast, but so I can do my start. I'm like, all right, we Gucci. Yeah, that was nice. I like that. <laughs> Let me get out real quick. And then I watched him do a start. I said, oh my. God, and he's just like no sweat, right? Just super easy. And like we talk about the force that he puts into the ground, he doesn't he doesn't see it. But I saw it. I'm like, man, that was like at least half a second faster than what I just ran. <laughs> he wasn't even trying. I'm like, I'm not running with Trayvon. I'm not doing it. See, that I wouldn't was... I wouldn't even put myself in that situation. They'd be like, Hey, you want to run this one? Nope. Mm-mm. See what happened was I had to get some water. So I'm gonna make sure I stay away from this man because he was that fast. But talk to me or talk to us about. Um, I think it was the Olympics and how the first round, how you approached it this time around because it didn't go as well as you had wanted it to in the previous championship. So, yeah, I had, I had a talk like with my therapist about this a lot, and I think I went in with the mentality of knowing, like, okay, yeah, I'm back running. You know, I'm running fast times, like everything good. Uh, and I feel like because I've never, I've never led the season with right. a fast time before in my previous, obviously before the injury, uh, I kind of went into it thinking like, oh, I'm so far away, like this easy, this easy, you know what I'm saying? This cakewalk. Not understanding once again my first medals. I was a child, like I was coming out of 19, I was 20 years old, right. so I didn't understand the uh, the tension that came with it because right. you know we had the big names of like Bolt, Gatlin, Tyson, Johan, still at like a good peak shape. So they're looking at like, oh, those are the guys are watching. I'm just a young kid, like, well, I'm just trying to get on the podium, you know what I'm saying? So with coming back in, I'm like, okay, I'm running fast times. I'm a top dog. Ain't nobody catching me. Like I'm good. So right. when I'm going into the race, I'm being I'm being everything that I kind of preach about not being. Like I, I feel like I probably got complacent. Like I was like, oh, I can cruise through this. I'm good. Like Makes I'm sense. I'm a nine seven runner. Who gonna who gonna catch me? And then when I'm like getting to the line, I'm like, oh snap! People next to me like, what is happening? <laughs> you know. Right. So right. it's like I'm now with this go around. I took it as like a professional mindset. Right. Like you don't give nobody no opportunities. Right. Like you get so far out till they can't catch you or you bury them into the ground. Yep. So that's the mentality that I had coming into this go round. Like that first round, I was like, oh no, we Olympics ain't happening this time. Right. Like you finna have to chase me. Like if you gonna beat me, you gonna have to run nine seven. Like yeah. that's that's how I feel I truly felt. Cause I know you around. I know you guys have heard it a bunch and we and we've talked about it in the past with, with yeah. our guy Will London. Like yeah, yeah. in the longer sprints, a lot of times the thought is survive in advance. Mm-hmm. 
But in the hundred, it's like you can't really do that yeah. because there's gonna yeah. be cats. Like I saw in the in the heats of the two hundred, mm -hmm. had a couple guys run PBs, yeah. and it's like, well, if you go in there thinking I'm gonna survive in advance, you could easily get pushed get right to the point out. where you're like, oh my god, my time has to get me in, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So you got to go into it running. And I thought mm -hmm. what you just explained is exactly how I felt about it in that moment. It was like you were the fastest in the world. Yeah, and I promise you that day of, of the prelims here at Worlds. That was, the Olympics was the first thing I thought about. Right. I was like, you will not go into this one looking like that. You right. won't. Like, right. that was the first thing I thought about. So I, I think I took it as motivation to take it a little serious this right. go around. The, you mentioned a therapist, and I think that's something that's important. I mean, Noah Lyles very openly, I think, said, yeah. I think when he, they, someone had asked him, like, why are, why are you so excited about this track meet? He was, like, coming through the mix zone, like, all smiles. He was like, because you know, it was the first chance I get to be at a major championship where I could fill the stands with family, you know, friends. He's, like, my therapist. And he's he's been very vocal about how important a therapist has been for him and just sort of his mental, you know, health and his, you know, sports performance in, the, in that sense. So for you, how long has that been a process? And just how much did you rely on them uh, during the uh, – Hey Marvin, Between don't be that guy. Olympics. Oh, here we go. Uh -huh. okay, give <laughs> us this five more minutes. Give, give yeah. us question. Marvin, give Finish us his five. Question. Finish, Finish his question. Finish his question. Marvin, give us five minutes not before talk the while party I'm in the room. start. Don't talk while I'm in the room. Take them black forces off. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, what are you saying? So, no, the importance of having a therapist, and you know, like, especially after Tokyo for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, so it was it was very important to me because I I left the track meet not knowing what went wrong. Um, I try to analyze it and even some around me would probably say that I need to stop analyzing so much because but that's what we do right I was out of the sport for so long they come back and not go the way I wanted to go I super analyzed everything right. like I was trying to figure out what went wrong what did I do I'm watching film I'm like did I not push do I not like was I not sleeping right was it, is it my shoes is it like I try to super analyze everything oh, right you. and so then people was like you might need to get a therapist because I needed somebody to talk to about it because at the at the time I didn't want to kind of hear the criticism like oh maybe they're like I ain't want to hear that you know so I just wanted to focus on what I could do to be better so the therapist truly helped because he he helped me see things from a different perspective uh from a mental state right so that's I think that's the beauty behind having those type of people in your circle yeah I was gonna say it's um you know a lot, there's a lot of taboo around mm -hmm. therapy and oh well you're you're not strong enough mentally because you need a therapist and all that. Now I personally never haven't used a therapist, but um, I don't ever talk down or look down on anyone that does because that stuff is helpful, right? So for me, my therapist is my wife, right? I can talk to my wife about things, and uh, you know that's my best friend. So that's kind of how I use it. And for athletes to they have to know that you have to have an outlet for that. It can't always be your boys and your friends and all that. Sometimes you need to go to a professional so they can help you untwine your mind in a way that helps you perform freely. Um, and I think that is a big, a big, an important part of people getting to their peak performance. Sometimes um, it's just one cue too, right? Like you might have hours and hours of conversations and yep. it's great to speak your mind and whatnot, yep. but then they give you one thing, one cue, yeah. that in those big moments, then it's like, well, that's gonna stick with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it could be that thing that, that mm. gets you to stop analyzing, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You can analyze through the conversation with the therapist and figure sure. it out, but then they can tell you, all right, now once you get to here, yeah, exactly. that's it. Now, you, now you're not doing anything that's helping you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I know that only because I've talked with, with the players, both, track and field athletes, football players, basketball players that have used therapy and, and say, you know, they swear by it. Yeah. Um, so I think people should be open to that possibility if you're, if you're in, you know, at a situation where you, you need a, a breakthrough. I think it's amazing because there's probably so many athletes, so many guys who are like, I'm too tough to get, you know, right. and like for you two to be endorsing it and just, you know, encouraging people, that means a lot. And also, I just want to say your daughters are so cute. <laughs> waving at, they've been on the side waving at you the whole time. They are adorable. They stole the show like they showed us on the big screen a couple of days ago. I'm like, hey, how's everybody doing? Kids, come on. No, this yeah. is my camera. I mean, they are they are the best. I just I always say I'm just glad they look like their mother. They uh, they are they're adorable and uh, they make life so much more fun to live. I love that we managed to get deep before the party really begins. So should oh, we bring we on Marvin Bracy, the world indoor medalist at 60 meters, and now the still got the forces on. Sil silver medalist <laughs> in the 100 up, at the world championships. Marvin, Thanks it is five, really good to see you. Grab well, that mic there. Or, for, or we no, uh, we're going to get him a launch, yeah. 
You don't get a good shot. But just so you know, on the angle of the camera, he's going to look huge compared to you. They're pretty good. All right, so Marvin, the first thing we've been leading off with with so many of these athletes is like, how did you celebrate? You could tell us the full story. Dude. Um, so actually, when we got back after like drug testing and everything, Trey texted me and was like, hey man, uh, Fred wants to go take a shot. Okay, we can go do that. So he gonna tell us the real uh, story. No, thank, thank you, you Marvin. Marvin. We've heard some. Like, we'll take a shot. I said, okay, we can go do that. It's like midnight now. I'm like, all right, I done got a couple in bed. So we go walk across the street to a bar, but it was closed. So it's like it's like <laughs> one day one we hot. So we start looking around. Like, all right, we in Eugene, everything shut down. So we walk. We slowly walk back to the hotel, and we just kind of like detail, you know, our thoughts and perceptions on a race, you know, from each person's perspective or whatever. And by the time we got back, we sat in a lobby for about two hours. It was like three thirty in the morning. You know, everybody's yawning like. I go and then I go back. We go back to the room and I actually never fell asleep. <laughs> oh, okay. Just going through Twitter, man. So, yeah, I never, I never fell asleep, man. I was, just, I was just way too amped. So uh, came back out and the next day was probably the longest day of my life. This man ran so fast he ran to the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so did that walk. I mean, I wish we could. You know, do you know how much people would pay to be probably like a fly on the wall just for to hear that that walk? What, what was there? Emotion, like was there laughs? What was it? We can you describe actually, it? We actually almost rematched barefoot in the street. They were scared. Oh. They were scared. I, no, <laughs> they, they didn't want to give me my rematch. She was like, we took our shoes off. Like it was like, all right, pull the pole because you know we. It was just no, nah, just way too close to call. That's why we saw the videos of Fred training somewhere. Where was it? It was in. He was running up hills and stuff. Oh, so yeah. Fred might have still been the favorite in that. One. <laughs> <laughs> the street race. No, well, I do see that you got your shoes on. The, the Air Force. Oh, the right? forces. Yeah, you gotta keep them on. You know, you gotta be ready for anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the city is mag <laughs> podcast. It's not that serious. Hey, listen, everything is legal in Eugene. I don't know what's going on. Everything That's is what we're legal. About the cookies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that cookie is fire, though. Wow, I'm gonna be on fire. So, <laughs> when did you finally get some sleep? Um, I actually went to the track the next day to watch some of the events, and I fell asleep in a tent. <laughs> like I just passed out. Yeah, get, get ready for the medal ceremony. I passed out. Yeah, he had, they had to come wake me up because I was just I was just out of it. It was hot, and my body just said, "All right, it's enough." And it was so. This is what three o'clock. I just passed out. There's that photo of you sitting down in the call room, I think, uh, with your you had sunglasses on. <laughs> Put that out. Where's that going? It's it out Vernon. Vernon. It was but Vernon. Vernon retweeted. Oh, Vernon, it. man, y'all are always <laughs> going at it. He must have like a filter on his Twitter that just like says Marvin Bracey. Well, he has. He just he showed me the other day. He has like tweets in his drafts. So, like, <laughs> Ready for Ready. you. Like, Ready. Oh. He has. He's just some stuff gonna come out. Like he got. He has more stuff loaded. Wow. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so that photo of you just sitting down there, like you look really cool. What's going through your head in in, in the call room? I guess walk us through the moments leading up to to um, the race. So you know, a call room is probably one of the most tense places like in the world. Like you could cut the tension with a knife, man, because you got eight dudes who are all like locked they're trying to like get as mentally focused because like your coach is there no more so there's nobody else to kind of like you know tell you like come on you know, do this do this so you're thinking for 30 minutes you got th the car room is literally it's usually 30 minutes before the race so you got 30 minutes to kind of like play back everything that you've done up to this point and you got to like focus and like and be able to execute that and it's about who can kind of stay locked in there the most so for me you know i just i went in you know i just i'm just stone faced because i'm processing everything that I've been through, you know, everything that I want to, you know, what I want to achieve and stuff like that. So I was just trying to say, dialed in. I didn't realize like the camera would like make it look like I was, you know, <laughs> just out of it now. Like I, I love the picture though. It's a great picture, man. But you just, when you're in a car room, you just say locked in and people don't know that there's two car rooms. So in that one, we were still outside by the track. They walk you up under the track and um, that's when you get your hip numbers, your bibs and stuff. And they, you know, you get race ready. And they walk you out, and that walk is probably one of the most like intense walks like you're gonna do because it's you're like it's it's building up as you get closer, like you get a little bit more nervous, you know what I'm saying? You get a little more ready, and then you come outside and it's just time to go. Jasmine, I think it was Jasmine's idea that she was pitching to us yesterday on our podcast was that we should have like more of a red carpet walk in <laughs> to the stadium mm. for athletes. I well, then that's that's when he would bust those. Yeah, out. right. Yeah. Exactly. And then you get changed in the locker room, so and then you come out. It's funny that that came up because we talked about this. I think it was like last year. There was like you know how like NBA players, and NFL players come dressed up. You know they get to walk through, they take the pictures and stuff. Yep. And you only see. And what people don't know is you know being that I did you know participate in like a preseason or two. You come straight from the hotel. The hotel is literally close to the stadium. So you come from the hotel and you, you have that on for 10 minutes. Exactly. Drive over. No <laughs> doubt. Go change and put on football clothes. So it's like, you know, 
I think we should have the same thing. I think that'd be nice. Yeah, just a way to showcase personalities and. I'll exactly. be the flies. Yeah. <laughs> no, see, Shout out to my stylist. <laughs> These are the no. conversations. Yeah. <laughs> you have a stylist? Just to you. <laughs> no, but Bracey's right. He's hundred percent correct about that when it when it comes to football. And the first now first time I met Bracey back in twenty sixteen was at a party at Florida State. All right. So I was I was going there because I you know I shot my shot at my wife at that point, and, uh, <laughs> so I was making sure I was present. Um, but that was before Bracey had uh, you know started to make his transition to pursue his NFL dream. Um, so when he's talking about like that pageantry when you see us walk in, I mean literally some guys wear the same suit to the plane that they do to the stadium the next day because you're only having on for ten minutes, and it's just another aspect to kind of to show the athletes in a different light. So I think 100% we, that we should definitely do that. But we were talking to Trayvon about his story and how the, you know, the three races in three years and all the injuries and, and coming back and meddling. Talk to us a little bit about your journey to football and then back to track, which is just something that you don't really often see. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, this guy, for one, knows you know everything that I've been through when it came to you know going to play football. So. I had uh, I made a decision after the Olympic after making the Olympic team in the hundred. I made a decision. I was like, you know what, man, I'm done with this. Like I've made it to the ultimate pinnacle of track and field. You know, obviously I didn't get a medal. I finished 14th overall. I was like, you know, this is like I'm. I gotta go play football. Like I, this is this is the time. I'm 22 years old. You know, I still got that itch. And so I reached out to an agent uh, by the name of Joby Branion. He gave me an opportunity to sign me. Well, we 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 signed and uh, I, immediately he started making calls and I was getting like pro day invites and and camp invites and what and like a uh, rookie mini camp invites. I'm sorry. And um, I did a rookie mini camp with uh, um, I did it with the Panthers. I did it with New Orleans Saints. And my name kind of got out there a little bit. And then um, the Cowboys actually cut Lucky Whitehead. Yep. And they called me the next day, flew me out to California, and they didn't sign me. I was like, okay, but at least I know what the workout looks like. So then, like a week later, the Indianapolis Colts give me a call. I go work out for him, run a forty for him. I think I ran like four thirty two at the time, and uh, they signed me on the spot. Participated in uh, participated in camp, and I ended up getting cut. And I was like, all right, at least I know what the camp is like. So the next time I go through this process, I'll, I'll be ready. I know how to like, study the playbook because, man, like what those guys go through, I can only imagine for a quarterback, like I got to know certain jobs, but he has to know 22 jobs, you know. So that's that's a whole different level we don't have to get into. But um, the very ne the next year, the Seattle Seahawks called me for a camp, and I signed with them, and I went through the went through the process, and I ended up getting, I ended up getting cut, and they brought me on a practice squad, like on and off or whatever. And um, again, like it, it didn't work out. So I was like, all right, I got one more year in me of, of going through this because I'm not good at doing nothing, you know? So then uh, they started the AAF uh, league the very next year in 2019. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna shoot one for the league. They had a team in Orlando, so I'm at home. So I joined the team, whatever, go through the camp, make the team, very first game, I break my arm. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is some bull. Like, I, I wasn't breaking bones running track, man. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this ain't it, you know. I ain't done. I ain't really done nothing. I ain't gained a bunch of weight. I was like 190, face fat. You know, I tried to grow dreads and everything. I was going through something. Uh, <laughs> I remember. I saw him. So I just... <laughs> like, listen, it was rough, man. Like, it was it was a process. And then um, I break my arm. I say, you know what? I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going. This is just another test. We, I come back week seven. I'm coming out the field to practice. My first practice back. They called us back in the locker room. They was like, hey, we just want to let y'all know that the league has folded. Yep. So there's no more money. Instantly, that's all the paycheck gone. I'm like, all right, if there was ever a sign, this is it. Like, this, it's done. I'm not, I don't want to play football no more. Like, this is stressful. Like, it's not, I thought it was going to be fun. You know, I was looking, you know, to be one of the, no, I'm not doing that. So <laughs> I, watched, I, watched, uh, I watched Christian Coleman win the world champs. And I'm like, you know, I saw his career progress. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. You know, I can, I can be one of those guys. Man, it just takes a lot more work. You know, when I, I started professional at 19 years old, and to be honest, my off the track life didn't match what I was trying to get done on the track. And um, I knew that. So I was like, you know, at this time, I'm not going to rob myself of, you know, opportunities. I'm going to be more diligent. I'm going to be more disciplined. So I started training uh, with Coach Lance Brahman. And I went to the indoor USA Championships in 2020. And I ran 649. At the time, that was my second fastest time ever. And I had been removed from the sport three years. Yep. So then Nike gives me a call. You know, they signed me. I, moved, I did, but then I had to change coaches because uh, Lance is Adidas. And that's when I joined them up in Jacksonville with Coach Raina Ryder. And I think three months in, I ended up having two surgeries. Ooh. So yeah, <laughs> I had two surgeries. I lost like 50 pounds. Um, I had my stomach was stapled. 50 pounds? Yeah, I was like 140, man. I was stapled from That's like, like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
he came into practice. He looked sick. Yeah, I was. I just had. To I look sick, yeah, right? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean it That's like that. Me. He looked <laughs> sick. I was saying, cause like he said, he had gained weight. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So he, you know, when he lose, it's okay. Weight, he had, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. He had the 50 pounds to lose. <laughs> now I was 50 pounds down, man. It was. It got ugly for a while, man. I was. It wasn't even about. It wasn't even about you know running anymore. It was about the fact like, damn, will I ever be the same again? You know, I had my appendix rupture, and then I had like blockage in my intestines, so they had to cut me open and take it all out. Sew me back together. Um, that process took about three months. So I didn't eat for like a month and a half, like wow. just on a water diet, you know. And like I said, I lost weight. And then um, I, re I reached out to my coach. And like as I started feeling better, it was like mid September. And he was like, oh, okay, well, practice starts October 18th. I was like, motherfucker, what? <laughs> <laughs> not doing that? Like, what are you talking about? I was just on the bed for a month and a half. I'm not doing that. He was like, man, practice starts October 18th. But I did, I did come back. Um, and he told me, he was like, man, we're probably not going to run fast indoors, but it's a part of the process. You just gotta trust it. And I was like, what is that to say to somebody? Because I'm one thing for certain two times for sure, I'm gonna be able to run indoors. I'm gonna run fast indoors. I don't get done what happened after that. And I ran like six sixty five and it was a little bit demoralizing. But I just kinda, you know, I kinda stayed with it and I mean by the end of the season I ran what, nine, eight, three times, four yep. times. And, you know, if it wasn't for a blunder, you know, at the trials cramping up, man, who who knows, you know, what the story would have been. But I mean, it ended up working out a year later, you know, I'm a silver medalist at the world championships, a part of a sweep, you know, making history. So, I mean, God's timing. Amazing. That story yeah. needs to be told, right? So here's a, s something interesting to think about because, you know, Kyle and I, you know, we work together. You know, we are out here to promote track and field as much as we can. And, you know, to the outside people looking in, people are like, these guys are best friends. And, like, we're, we're close friends. And then someone had once asked, we're, 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 we wouldn't say best, best <laughs> friends. Someone had once asked us sort of like, do you two outside of track ever talk about family and feelings and all that kind of stuff? Now you two, like, do you guys share that kind of stuff off the track? I know, you, you know, famously in the mix zone, you said that in October, that's when you guys started talking about, you know, being on the podium and stuff, but off the track stuff, like is Trayvon someone that you also talk to? Is Marvin someone you call? Don't see if, I text told messages. You what, <laughs> if I told you what we talked about outside of track, even at practice, if I told you what the practice conversation was like, we might get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people would like us very much. Like, I would not we don't need that on a Netflix special. <laughs> yeah, 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 leave that part it out. It would be a Netflix <laughs> special. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it would, it, would, it, would, it would get ugly. Like, it's, and it's not bad stuff, it's just stuff that like I really Really wouldn't say out loud like to somebody <laughs> like it's just it's your you Twitter your drafts. Audience, yeah, you gotta know you gotta know your audience. Yeah, right. but no, we definitely he's definitely somebody I consider a friend, man. I've been knowing him almost what ten years now. You know, um, we I grew up in Orlando. He's in St. Petersburg. That's about an hour, hour and a half away. Um, you know, I've, I've watched his career. You know, up close, and you know, we made the Olympic team together. We went out in the sport together. Yep. We came back together. So you know, that was a part of our story and a part of our testament, like you said, and that's a story that needs to be told because he went out with an injury, I walked away willingly, and we kind of met back, and now we train together, yep. and we're on a team together, you know? And so two kids from Florida, man, you know, living the same dream. How much does that mean to, you know, the parts of Florida that you guys are from? I mean, Trey, you openly speak about, like, how hard it was growing up sometimes, and now that, you know, the kids in those communities can look and see the two of you as, as inspiration for the potential that you guys, uh, that anyone can have, you know, coming out of those circumstances. Yeah, man, um, well, first and foremost, like, when it comes to someone like Marvin and a lot of other friends that I have that come from that same background, it makes it more special and meaningful. I connect with a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? I got a lot of boys, like everybody in my in my group I'm cool with, but this moment, stuff like this, it means a little different because of where we come from. You know, it's, when I was growing up, yo, like, and Rob can tell you, like, going into Baylor, it's not an easy school to get into. Like, when my coach came in, you know, with the grades and everything, like, he was like, man, it's going to be hard to get you in the school. And I told him, look, it's either I get in the school or I'm going to be in the streets. Right. Like, simple as that. In my life, like, I went to an F school. Like, my school almost got shut down. What do you care about grades? Like, I was on the south side of the hood. Like, just like me and Marvin, we've been tatted since young teens. Like, in our culture, you don't make it out. So, for situations like this, like it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, and it's something that we want to get kids to understand that come from where we come from because you can make it out. You yep. know what I'm saying? Like you're looking at two people from the same type of neighborhoods now on podiums getting medals. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So that's like that's the big message that we try to get across to people because mm -hmm. when you look at us and you see us tatted up as young teens, they automatically going to put us in the bubble and say, nah, they're going to be probably in jail, dead, or yep. working at Walmart somewhere. Not saying working at Walmart, bad. But <laughs> I'm just saying, that, that, that's just what the reality of it is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that you look, yeah. Like I said, you're looking at people who he, he's taste some of the NFL, and he's now a medalist. Like, yep. I went off to college, I got two degrees, and I'm a medalist. That goes against the odds of what we know. No and doubt. now we can show people that you can make it somewhere. And stay there for a little bit, because, like, anybody that's listening to this right now, you understand uh, – 
just how smart you guys are, right? So Marvin, you brought up um, the Trey. You brought up how, you know where you guys come from and, and the degrees you got and all the experience you have now. But you brought up the fact that y'all were doing a play by play, essentially how the race went in that hundred final from each one of you. And that's something I would love to have sat in on that conversation because people think like it's, oh, just get out the blocks and run real fast. That's not what it is. Track is so much more nuanced than that. And to, to listen to you guys talk, obviously I've been around Trey a lot and Marvin, I've seen you a bunch. I've seen you when you were like dreaded up. You remember that was at the Claremont track. We yeah, was there. I mean, yeah. right? so, I, I, so I I feel like I got the inside scoop yeah. on these guys and what, they, what they've been through. But um, to see you guys now accomplish what you did, talking the way that you guys talk with the degrees that you have and the knowledge that you have, the expertise, you're showing these kids that grew up where you're at that you, don't, you can do more than just gangbang. You can do more than just be an athlete and actually be an expert. That's what you guys are. You're experts at what you do. You can break down the 100 better than anybody else out there, including Otto Bolden, right now, <laughs> okay? Because you, the, the sport has evolved. Um, what you guys go through and know about your bodies, like you guys both run it differently. Yeah. You run the race a little bit differently. So that to me is the fascinating part. And that's a story that also needs to be told so those kids can see that. You know, there's some there's some geniuses out yeah, there listen, slinging man, dope on listen, the streets now. Yeah, okay, no, that's where that's where you know that's where a lot of you know my uh, weird enough the the, the the dope boys in the hood were the ones who were telling us not to sell drugs. I'm exactly, like, you're but you're doing it. Doing <laughs> it. Like, you, you got you pulling out not some money. You don't think I want that? You right. know, and as a kid, like you know, you get enticed by that. You know, I lost I lost my I lost my dad at ten years old. So you know, he got shot by a cop. And um, so I grew up, you know, without a male in the house. My mom had me at 16. Right. So, you know, all of my influence came from outside of the house because she had me at 16, my brother at 21. Right. And um, she's raising two kids on all. His dad is also dead. Right. So, you know, growing up like that, you have no choice but to learn from outside of the house. And the older male figures we saw were the ones that's on the corner, you know, selling yeah. drugs and stuff like that. And they're the ones saying, hey, man, you know, stay the hell from out here. And right. Like, you know, and, it, and it's kind of hard because you see the fast money coming, you see how they're living in the cars mm -hmm. they got in. Right. Just, you know, the, the, the women that are around them, and just, just the, all of the social stigmas that come with it. Yep. And you want that as a kid and you don't really understand why Why would I not want that lifestyle right. if you're doing it. And then it takes for you to get older and have experiences of your own to realize, yeah, this might not be for me. Right. You know, it's just, it's just not for everybody, man. Well, Trey, one of the reasons why I became a big fan of you long before we met was because of the stuff that you did with the community and kids and the essay contest and scholarship stuff. What is that for you guys, like giving back to the kids? Like that, you know, I think the off season, that's probably one of the most special things that you guys do, right? Is like being able to speak with young athletes or kids from your community. Yeah, um, I think that's the one of the biggest things of why we do it. Uh, Growing up, I know Marvin probably speak for his own experience, but I know for myself, I really didn't have a lot of idols in the sports world that I can, like, connect to, that I could be like, hey, you know, reach out, get some advice, or figure out how to do this. Like, we got it out of the mud. So, like, now it's, I want to be able to give, like, these type of opportunities to a lot of the young kids, especially, like, out of these communities who, like like Rob said, like, a lot of these kids in the community that is in the streets, they be talented. Very but they have no, they don't have no guidance. Like yeah. most of us didn't have no guidance, so they don't never get the opportunity to get out of that door. Like y'all probably heard me a couple of times say, like I want to be a voice for the voiceless because that's in the that's the position that they're in right yeah. now. They don't have an opportunity to say, hey, I want to. You know how many people probably in the hood be like, yeah, I go to college for free. You pay for everything? <laughs> well, I, I kid you not. Like my brother came to Baylor one time and he was like, he seen all these snacks and all this stuff that like the the athletics was giving. He was like. What a cashier why I pay for this? I said, bro, this free. He said, what? He said, y'all he said y'all get free Gatorades? They pay you too. <laughs> like, exactly. So, like when you take kids like us up out of the hood, like we like, we ain't know we can have a lifestyle like this. Man, I was at Baylor chilling. Like, yep. Everything paid for, rent, car paid for. All the, man, I'm good. All you so, gotta do is focus on That's why we want to try to help kids understand like you can get out of the streets. Like it's a life outside of, you know, 34th Street south of the the central uh central St. Peter, you know, you know, where Marvin from as well. Like it's it's other areas out there to venture off to. And Chris, you were talking about that, like how do we get that story to be told? Because the kids in those situations, like my family, I'm I don't claim New Orleans because I only lived there for a year. But my whole family's from New Orleans. My dad has seven brothers and sisters, all my aunts, uncles, cousins, they all live in New Orleans. And they just don't know what they don't know. Right. Yeah. Because you don't see it. Yeah. And if you don't see it, it's hard for you to believe that it's possible. So when Trey comes to Baylor and he sees all these free snacks and everything, like, oh man, we living a life. Like this is this is what it is. And and we gotta be able to fridge with Gatorades. Backpacks. Okay. So we gotta be able to show 
those kids in those communities that it's possible because the ones that grow up in the affluent communities, they know it's possible. So it's almost like some kids, like I want my kids to go to college and it be a downgrade. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what we're building for our, yeah. for our future well, for all of us, including myself, because I wasn't a well to do kid. It was an upgrade. Right. I get a clean you get a clean house. You get free food. You get money. Like those are things that we got to be able to show these kids that they can do and show them that. Right. It doesn't matter where you're from, how you talk, what your dialect is. You can still be viewed as intelligent and be a master at your craft, just like these guys are. And, you know, my story is uh it was a little bit different obviously you know we, we got the same ending point but um for me sports was my only way out i never really had a plan b so for me um i'm actually my one of my dreams is to own my own sports academy you know um that covers you know damn all sports starting with um i'm starting to travel ball baseball league back at home because uh, you know a lot of us we push up well and you know in my community we had uh we had, you know, everybody knows what Pop Warner football is, but not a lot of people know what City League is. Right. And for us, man, City League, it was like a $25 registration fee, and it was sad because some kids couldn't afford that. $25 registration fee that covers, like, your physicals, the helmets and shoulder pads that the league provides and stuff like that, man. And, you know, coaches had to get us cleats. Some coaches were paying the registration fees, and sometimes they was waving them for the kids that really couldn't afford it. Um, you play all your games at one at one venue, and the only motivation we had was to make it to the the, Florida, the Orlando Citrus Bowl because that's where the championship was. Right. And so um, for me, you know, we push our kids, and we only had football and sometimes basketball. So you know, I'm starting with baseball because obviously we know you know baseball is where the real money at, and um, you just never know we could be sitting on the next Ken Griffey or B.J. Upton yep. or Andrew McCutcheon or something like that. You just you, you could be sitting on the gold mine, right. you know, because um, a lot of people like a lot of people are not gonna make it just through education. You know, what I'm saying it's hard because. They only giving out so much for grants and aids and stuff like that, man. And then when I, I started running track in the 10th grade, just cause, like, I swear to God, like, I just went out because my friends did. And I ended up running, like, 10-19, and I won a state championship. And that is what, you know, changed my life for the better. And so, you know, sports was my way out. And I know that that can be, you know, the way for somebody else. Wow. I just think it's, like, an opportunity, right? Like, sometimes it's just, I just need a lane. Yeah. And other times, I mean, Trey, you you just need to get into school. And now, you know, what you studied is applying to what you're doing today, right? Like, you studied physiology. I mean, the, the amount that you guys break down now and, like, how educated and smart you are about your event is just because you had an opportunity. Yep. So, uh, yeah. thank you guys for sharing that. I mean, I wish you could see the YouTube comments right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. people are, And this is, it's like, we need platforms in which people can tell these stories because you can't tell this in 10 minutes no, no you really can't, no, you really can't. yeah you guys are doing a phenomenal job providing We're providing just, the yeah. platform <laughs> yeah i mean it's sort of like the broadcast uh on tv it's on usa network you know yeah. preceding it is seven hours of law and order svu why don't why didn't they give us like a little hour we could have done this on uh, on tv but uh I, Marvin, I kind of Noah Lyles kind of p- took a Twitter and said like someone needs to do a story or you know film a movie based on sort of your story. And then Raven Saunders quote tweeted it, and we saw this one, and we're like, <laughs> I think someone's got to fact check this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this man, pl- she she tweeted, she said, this man played NFL football. Not true. That's true. Oh, it is true. That's oh, yeah, true. that's right. It is that's true. true. Yeah. It is true. Join the army. No, I didn't join. The army. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Keep going. I, I thought this part maybe her finger slipped because she's a thrower and she typed in the wrong number. She said had seven kids. I did not have seven. No, this, oh I did my. not have seven kids, man. <laughs> <laughs> I came uh, back to track. That's true. That's true. Through shot put. I would never. <laughs> not at one forty. Yeah. No, no, no. Pause. He'd be at practice all the time talking oh. about what other events he could do. <laughs> I swear to God, I'd be wanting to kill myself. <laughs> Trey, bro, if you think I had three years, I could know. No. No. What event? No. What are you hyping up? Every, it's a every new sport. event every time. Like, it's a new sport. It's a new event. It's like, it's. I think I could average 40 in the NBA. In the oh, <laughs> average 40 in the NBA. Okay. <laughs> we'll be having a whole 250 row. Hey, bro. Got to get think? you in the big three you first. Get him in the like, big three. To me, it's just nothing I can't do, man. Like, if you give me the time, like, I'm going to figure it out. No. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last part was went back to the hundred. Now my boy's a world champ silver medalist. So all of that uh, is true. Um, speaking of doing other events, Vernon Norwood came on our show, and he said that next year he's a little uh, intrigued by doing the eight hundred. What did he say? Did you hear Ooh. how fat? Did you hear this? Really? Not only does he want to do the eight hundred, he says he's going to do it like once. Okay. He guess what time you think? He said one forty four. He said one forty five. He's not running. One forty five. He's not running one forty five. He's not doing. It. I'm sorry. Like, you know, he's he's gonna make the team. <laughs> 
Yeah, one forty five. You better be this year. Yeah, no, bro. No, no, no. Bring that chill. Kevin Brazier right now is like, I hope he doesn't. Right. Now Fred, that might be a different story. I don't know. Fred, Fred, Fred might be one forty four. Well, you remember, you remember Jeremy yeah. tried to run the Jeremy yeah. Warner tried to run the yeah, yeah, yeah. one fifty four somewhere in there. Yeah, I can't remember what it was, but so respectable. Well, if you just if you've never run it before to come out, even if you're physically capable, and that was the thing that Vernon it was like. First, he said he was gonna do one, and he said one forty five. And one, no, bro, no. <laughs> oh, hell, no. <laughs> I mean, he, he over here critiquing the, the world championship silver medalist, you know, saying he folded like a lawn chair. So if he's got that much courage to send that tweet out, he might have enough courage might, to run 145. You never know, man. You never know. Nah, he's, what do you remember fast. the first time you met Vernon? Because, like, I think we got his side. The first time, damn, I don't know. The first time, it might have been. I can only imagine these text messages. I mean, is he in the group chat? Who's no, in the group no, chat? A, it's a separate group chat with me, <laughs> Vernon, uh, Will London, and Michael Cherry. And I swear, Ooh. if I told you, Ooh. if I told you, if I told you what was in there, I promise you we'd be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of I those group get, chats. These, like these is fire. I gotta <laughs> get another cookie, man. You. Before you hit send, you like check six yeah, times you, to make sure it's going to the right people. Yeah, yeah. Like, man, it better. He will say something, and then like it'll just the silent. The chat will be dead for like a. There too, and he'll just come in and say like the most outlandish thing. <laughs> like it's like, dude, how do you wake up and think of this? Like we even at practice, I ain't had breakfast yet. Like what are you, what are you doing up there? Like and you were out I behind, breakfast so what yet. are you doing? Like, I'm trying to eat. Yeah. Like, oh, what was the story he told us about uh, him blasting? You you came down to breakfast. Oh, it was blasting. In Stockholm. Oh my God. So listen. I... <laughs> so we, we was in we was in Stockholm. I think it was my first race after uh, it was at the trials, you know. So I'm I'm feeling a little pressure. I got I got to prove myself, you know. I just prepped up. I got to show that you know I could have made the team. So I come down. It's like seven o'clock in the morning in Stockholm. I'm going out listening to Tupac. Mm. Listen, <laughs> blasting, I was blasting. I got the headphones. I, I'm at the dinner table with four other people, but I'm not talking to them. I just got my music. Back. I don't want to hear nothing. Like the only thing I'm worried about. And it's seven in the morning. I think the race was at like five p.m. So Ooh. that's a long I'm, time. He's to super stay locked hyped. in. <laughs> <laughs> I got my ass kicked. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, no one can warm up that early. <laughs> I got sixth place, man. I, that shit hurt, bro. I went like I ran so bad, like I was like, I want to run again. Like there's just no way. Like, <laughs> can we run that back? Yeah, like there's just no way. I ran like ten one. I was like, yeah, bro, this is not all right. So I had to take a different approach, man. I had to calm down a little bit and just kind of approach it differently. But yeah, it was seven o'clock in the morning. I was listening to Hail Mary. I was like, yeah, I'm wild. Oh, <laughs> he was getting crunk. <laughs> Early at breakfast. At breakfast, yeah. <laughs> and him and Will was like, man, you gotta calm down. I'm gonna leave you alone. <laughs> I think uh, Ronnie was in a race. Um, actually, Marcel was in a race. Yeah. So you know, I'm like, all right, you know, I got, I got, I got to come out here and I got to run. Doesn't work. I was dead. You got to stay calm for the the mornings when you wake up, right? So one of the final things that that I've got. Um, for you guys is sort of the Jamaicans, uh, you know, have done a great job of, you know, taking this one, they I think they call it the one, two, three tour. Like it's she uh, Shelly Ann, Elaine and Sharika just, they, they don't mind going head to head at all these races, you know, at Diamond League and stuff, obviously like appearance fees, you know, play a factor into things and all that. But when they're in the same race, the Jamaican celebrators, like they're the one, two, three tour stops in Eugene, in Stockholm, in Oslo, wherever it is. You guys are our own one, two, three tour. Are you guys down to just kind of go head to head at races, you know, for going forward? We're actually, uh, I'm, I, you know, I think we're all gonna be in Poland. Uh, okay. On you know, August sixth, so you will get a you will get a one two three tour, and I want to race Fred Curly as much as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> you, tell, what, tell what's your all time head to head record? What? I gotta get my leg. I'm zero and two versus Curly, man. So I gotta get my leg back, man. I'm sick of that. Dude. There's a bet apparently. Yeah. So we made a we made a bet the other day. So we said, and I'm thinking about upping it because uh, I might be I might win. Uh, we <laughs> <laughs> Trayvon's eyes said, just rolled person. so far back his head. <laughs> we, made we said first person that runs uh, nine six would get five hundred dollars from each person. Ooh, so I'm thinking okay. about upping to a thousand because nine six is a. You, know, well, you guys all just got prize money and some bonuses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like so five hundred isn't what it used to be saying, a few days you know ago. Like, yeah, for that for those Definitely applications, not. like you know nine six, like that's a tall order. So. You know, but yeah, we should get we got to get those appearance fees up. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. American yeah. Sweep one, two, three tour started for the American side, just like they do for the Jamaicans. And then I, I promise you, they'll they wouldn't mind running if those appearance fees start. Your new to, agent, listen, I just want my thousand dollars. Whatever you want me to do, let's do it. Gotta be legal. Gotta be legal. I just want my nine. I just want my. I just want my thousand. You win legal, so don't get the two point one. That don't count. That has to be win legal. Yes, it has to be win legal. You get two point one. Everybody get no thousand dollars on the win. 
<laughs> we 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 too we too cold at this to yeah. be to be playing with the wind at the time. How <laughs> pissed are you guys when you finish a race and you see plus two point one? Uh, ask him. <laughs> ask me about the first race of the year. <laughs> Come on now, I'm, I'm thinking I'm like, oh yeah, I just showed up. I know this this gonna hit the media. It's good. I done ran all the way back to the warm up area. I didn't slow down. I, I, I'm getting my bag. I'm drinking my water. I'm about to text my agent. I'm like, oh yeah, we good. 2.1. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, That's my such God. A, there's no difference at I all. I you could just give me the 2.0. I'm like. Might man, as well be 3.5 at that point. Hey, right. Yeah, bro. <laughs> like, the, 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 the time went out of the window with me. One other question. Uh, this is my last one, I think. Yeah. So we had Grant here yesterday, and we were joking about um, – because, you know, one side of the track is in the shade at night and the other side is in the sun. And I was joking with him. I was like, we got to flip the track. <laughs> <laughs> make it a little hotter for you. How do you guys feel about the track flipping when uh, the wind is blowing one way or oh, the other? I'm all for it. Yeah, you like a, a flip we get, track? Paid, we get paid off. You know, times matter in this, in this sport, man. Yeah, at some time, in certain places, you know, places matter. But at most events, the time matters. So, you know, if we run into a negative 2.5, like, come on, I take a positive 2.5. I don't care if it's wind dated. Like, I just want to, you know. Because at the end of the day, still, your body's still moving fast, and you can come back and replicate that performance. So it'll be nice. You know, people want to see fast times anyway, whether exactly. it's wind-dated or not. Like, you exactly. know, they, they, they care, but they don't care. Like, most people at home watching don't even know what the wind means, you know? Right. So it's really the, the track world that sees a 2.7 and say, oh, man, he had, you know, what? hey, I still ran, though. Like, your body still moved. Whatever you ran, your body still moved that fast, Yeah. whether mm -hmm. it was helped or not. So I feel like we, I'm all for flipping it. How many years ago was that that DeGrasse ran like a 189 5? 2018. 2018. That was 18. How much attention did that get? Oh my goodness. Like, yeah. And like, a lot I'm of like, people I'm didn't like, even know about the win. What happened? Yeah. And then I saw the win dated, yeah. but, like, yeah. but I knew because I'm, I've am i been in the track world, so I knew that when that plays a big part into that. But the rest of the world the average person. Did, did not yeah, care. Mm -hmm. like, oh, he ran 9 5. Oh, he's a Usain Bolt. He's yeah, this, he's yeah. that. So I think what we talk about with track and field has to switch to how do we make the sport more consumable for the average fan yeah. because these guys deserve to make more money than they are so if you can if you can have the tracks to where they are flippable people want to see fast Just, times yeah. that's it i also think that like um with, you know what what, what dk did like that oh, race even though he didn't yes. win that race garnered so much attention because you took one of the league's fastest guys and yep. I mean, I was telling somebody this story. I was like, yeah, okay, he got last in that race. He still ran a respectable time for, you know, the training that he did or whatever. Yep. But the guy that won the race ended up getting, like, sixth at the Olympic trials. So yep. he didn't even race, you know, the best. So it would have put in perspective mm -hmm. yep. how fast we really are, you know, yep. next to who y'all guys are. And it's not out of disrespect, but, like, you know, we take a little bit of disrespect for every time somebody runs 20 miles an hour on their wind gauge. They're like, oh, on their, on their little speed gauge. And they're like, oh, he's world-class speed. I'm like, 20 oh. miles an hour. Oh, women run 24, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or on the treadmill, dog. Yeah, like, that, like, I was going to say, that's, that's my lead. Time, and then they always bro. have someone holding their back, right? Like, What's crazy like, is that the treadmill is making you go that fast. Like, Not you. We generate the speed yeah. off of our body. Don't like, get them started. The treadmill is making them <laughs> Don't fast. get them you know, started. Really I don't know. Me off, dog. Oh, it's so disrespectful. I ran 26 miles per hour. Oh, it's steaming. Now. Who was it? Who said he was gonna come and qualify? You, first of all, you gotta qualify for the Olympic trials. You don't qualify for the Olympics. Just, you know Who was that? Like, was that Tyree? No, it was DK. He said, "Oh, qualify yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah." Bro, you gotta you gotta get the standard for trials first. Like, bro, you gotta <laughs> right. be top thirty-two. You know what I, I thought I thought you guys did a great job of not in, trying to embarrass DK. No, like, no, because we respected the, it. Like, the we fact that he came out there, we don't want to discourage. We want more people to come out, so you know we can continue to keep this train rolling, so that yeah. you know people can still see. Like, we can bring that NFL attention because people don't really understand how fast we are because everybody in that race is fast. Exactly. So to them, it looks just like they just mundane. Yeah, yeah I can't remember. You put an average person in that race, they get beat by thirty meters. I couldn't remember who who was the last guy that beat DK in the race like the whole track world was like please please <laughs> beat him please, please beat, beat him beats one person <laughs> we ain't never been so proud of a 10-2 <laughs> like, like, yes, yes, yes yes thank you Jesus <laughs> <laughs> but no, I thought it was great because it did, like you said, it did bring a lot of attention to track and field. And there wasn't any of the premier runners in that race. Exactly, so it yeah. kind of just, I felt like it should have showed people they should respect you guys more. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. I don't like, I trained with Gatlin and yeah. LaShawn Merritt in 2018 and oh my gosh guys that was the hardest train i ever done because i every day i went to practice i knew i was gonna lose yeah, man. i just it's knew so i was hard. gonna lose but i got faster i, I literally i ran a 20 point in practice uh with gatlin and Lashawn, and i came in running like 22 and that was in three three months in three months i went from 22 to 20 point in practice 
And uh, like, this is there's something about training with fast people, that's, but it shows you like there's just a different level. Now that's definitely a huge advantage. I mean, look, I'm sitting next to you know one of the fastest guys of all time. Yeah. You know, so to train with somebody that's ran nine, you know, constant nine sevens, man, it kind of it lets you know where you are. Yep. You know, in comparison, because we, you know, we all low key at practice. If we don't run a rep together, we listen for times like. What, what Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah, I can't laughs> <laughs> hey, coach, wait, wait, He comes across the line. He's like, what? <laughs> okay, I got it. Nine eight. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> so nine, at least you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you like, all right, you like, nine, you eight, time hundreds eight. in practice pretty regularly. Or uh, not, not regularly. No, just like sometimes when we, or you just, you just kind of go off of like a, a a pace. So if we run like a one ten, if he runs, if he run. All right, cool, cool. I got you, got you. Yeah, so in my yeah. head, I'm like, 11 on a bus, 11 on a bus. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> or they do the flying hundreds. Yo, like, that, even, even when it ain't competitive, 30s. they get competitive. Yeah, look, look. Yeah. Well, Maurice was telling us about how, like, back in the day, they used to just bet on it, bet each other, like, who could run the slowest qualifying time out of the first round. And so is this is this something that you guys look at? Not like, we don't, so what? not, see. No, we ain't taking no risk like that. Maurice was trying to get them dudes to not qualify. I was mad. I was mad. I was mad at US uh, at Worlds because I was, like, I was in the first heat. So, you know, my coach told me to execute the race. I did exactly what he asked me to do. So he was, I get to the back, he's all happy and giddy. He was like, you ran it exactly how I wanted you to. I ran 10.05, shut down. I was like, all right, cool, that's a good day for me. You know, that's a great day. I'm ready to run 9.8, you know, I know that. And then next next heat, 9.7, I said, get them. <laughs> <laughs> and then he comes back and runs 9.8. I say, oh, I'm actually ran faster. <laughs> get in, get in heat three. Yeah, like, <laughs> Can I do it again? Yeah, man, I'm like, yo, and then people, you know, pop 9.9s, nine, I'm like, man, I should have, man. I'm I look slow. <laughs> well, we're excited to see you guys go again. Oh, you have more. We, can, we do this all yeah, day, we but we do know day. you have more stuff to do. Uh, who's the fastest to Twitter? Like, I think right after a race, because I, I think. Be, listen, I be having. I be having well, trip. Fred, <laughs> I think it felt. It felt like he ran with the phone in his speed suit. He <laughs> oh tweeted something out like immediately. Right? Was yeah, it, was it yeah, yeah, right after. I was in a tent. He came in the back. I was like, "Yo!" Oh, there was already a tweet. What did he say? Phase nineteen. Yeah, probably right after. But you're quick to. You're quick on Twitter. Listen, man. Listen, quick. <laughs> Quick, I need to see what's going on. Because <laughs> Vernon gave us his top three and like Twitter guys in track. Like, who who are your top three? Like the, uh, the shit talkers. I'll give it Fred, uh, Vernon. Greatness. Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Every other tweet. Every hour we press greatness. We buying land. <laughs> we, buying land. <laughs> we buying land. Oh my gosh, I saw that one too. Hey man, Fred's that funny, bro. Fred, Fred is Vernon, nice. and I would have to put myself in there, man. Like, yeah. I'm a character. You came at me because I didn't put you in one of my top redemptions. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. <laughs> I've seen. I'm like, top, okay, top five redemptions. I gotta be in here. <laughs> uh oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then Vernon was like, don't, don't, don't worry, Kyle. He just got lucky. <laughs> it wasn't redemption. He just got lucky. <laughs> Well, I was thinking about after USA's, we're in the mix zone waiting for you guys to come out. And then I'm like, they're all on Instagram Live yeah, right they're now <laughs> under the tunnel. So they took their phones away for Worlds. Yeah, 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 yeah. oh, if they would have let us keep it, because they always they tell you not to bring like the electronic stuff. They would have let us have it. Like, I would have went live on the podium. <laughs> Wait, they, they what's the zone? forces on? Yeah, they took my, with the forces on. They, I, I have my phone in my pocket. I, I, didn't, I didn't get that memo. I don't know if you guys saw this. Clayton Murphy ran a race this year. In Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico was there, yeah. in which he wore a microphone during the race. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah which is barely definitely <laughs> illegal. Did he win? <laughs> he won. He yeah. won. Yeah. Thank God you he got, won. You gotta win. And so it's him talking before you, you hear the breathing. Fair, though, yeah. I thought I thought Noah was going yeah, to Noah, in New York. Yeah, Noah got mic'd up yeah, in New York. Yeah, as well. He took it off for the race, though. Yeah, right? yeah. I was like, if he about to run with this, that's gonna be cold. If he, you know, what I'm saying, yeah, like that's crazy. Gonna put some serious down. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Marvin, Trey, Robert, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, this is a blast. I feel like this we could have done this for I, yeah. hours you, on yeah, end. Uh, we've got an interview coming right up with uh, World Athletics President Seb Co. Oh. Uh, we got the chance to sit down with him yesterday, and so uh, we got we, we didn't talk to him about uh, Devin Allen and the uh, the blocks, <laughs> oh. but uh, we, we had only, Maurice Green's analysis. On yeah, that. we only had yeah. 15 minutes with him, and so we didn't get a chance to pick uh, to change the rule right on the spot, yeah. but. Uh, he here's knows. that interview with Sebco. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. You guys got good chemistry this week. Yeah. So I haven't even given you a beer yet. I know. That was the promise. Uh, well, you'll get a beer later. Yeah, of Which, course. Mind you, it depends how the interview goes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Uh, so we're here in, in Eugene. The World Championships are finally here. How, are you, how, how do you feel about it? You're, you're, you've got a front row seat to all Day the action. Forward. Where else would I rather be in the world than here in Eugene, Track Town, where uh, World Championships is on? You know, I'm excited. And what we've seen so far tells me we made the right decision to be here. It's the first time it's the World Outdoor Championships, Senior Championships, mm -hmm. we've had juniors and we've had indoors, but this is the first time 
that we've had a world outdoor senior championships here and you know we need to build on that and we need to look eugene's been a fabulous host but in years to come i want to see this in la or chicago or miami or you know some of your big cities was it like christmas the night before did you sleep at all have you slept at all you know before this whole thing started sorry define sleep at the championship. <laughs> It's something that we used to do before this event started. Yeah, no, no, no. I go home after championships to sleep. But actually, you know, it's a, it's a labor of love. I mean, I'm doing what I want to do. It's a great job. It's the best job in sport. I mean, I don't want to be dismissive about other sports, but can you imagine being Federation president of some of those sports? Mm -hmm. I've got the best sport on the planet. So to bottle up the excitement and and just everything that's happening here. I mean, now, now that it's happening, there's after, on July 25th, how do we take this momentum and just keep it going? That's a really good question. And it's the question that we're focused, focusing a lot of our attention on. And you're right, we have, you know, we've, we've got a world championships here, but that is only the start of the story. It cannot be the end of it. You know, we had the world juniors here in 2014. You remember you guys were at the Portland, the mm -hmm. world indoors in 2016. And we always made it really clear that we wanted the US Track and Field Federation to apply for and you know successfully host a world champion. We've done that. And we've got a really interesting glide path now between now and 28. It's going to mean creating more events. You know what we're trying to do with the Continental Tour. We've got more gold medal, gold label races here than we've had before. Um, there are opportunities. We have a, a, a world race walk, um, uh, a, sorry, a ro world road racing championships, a completely new format. And there are some American cities that have shown interest in that. So we need to make sure we keep our foot hard to the pedal, as they say, and continue to create those opportunities. And, and it's important because, you know, I'm a great believer that it's competition that matters. People need to see more athletes of the stature uh, that you have in this country in domestic meetings so you know we're going to work closely with the u.s track and field federation we've we've just employed uh, a u.s agency to help us with some of the uh, you know driving some of these issues on the ground we're working with influencers we want to work more closely with the athletes as we're well. We're for hire. Yeah. You, like, <laughs> really? We're available. It's a job application. Yeah, I thought yeah, it was yeah. an interview, not yeah, a job yeah. application. <laughs> when you don't want to be Federation president anymore, that's when I'm job interviewing. <laughs> Do you want it now? <laughs> uh, then I heard the no sleep thing. <laughs> yeah. You, it sounds like you're quite wedded to your sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, looking beyond, how do we transcend the sport beyond just the bubble of track town? Because that's the, that's the big challenge. No, it is. And look, you have some fantastic assets here. If you look at high school programs, and I've got a lot of friends that are coaching in the high school system. One of my coaches, actually, and when I was a, in a in athletics, was Joe Newton, the legendary high school coach from uh, from uh, Chicago. So, look, I, I know that you've got great assets. It's still the most participated sport at high school level. You know, you've only got to go to the average high school in the states and see what's happening. You know, in a neighbourhood during cross country season, you know, hundreds of athletes out there. Um, 50 million recreational runners are, you know, they're not just jogging every couple of weeks, they're regular runners. Mm -hmm. We've got to get, we've got to link that. And you've got, you know, you've got, you are the powerhouse of track and field, you know, every now and again, the Jamaicans spoil the party, but, you know, <laughs> and East Africa dominates in, in endurance. But actually, if you look at the medals table, you guys finish at the top. So in a way, the challenge going forward, and it's been a challenge that, has we've not always got we've always not always met and that is how do we convert those great assets how do we convert the 50 million people that regularly run into believing that they're part of what they're seeing out here and that is the challenge going forward and that will be around improving our outreach programs speaking to people outside of the athletics beltway making sure that we really are pushing our data and that's going to be one of the big you know big focuses in the next three or four years really building the database and understanding where our fans are who they are what they want and how we can meet their needs 
Now you're sitting down with two New Yorkers, and we, you've stressed hey, the I importance. Guess that. Of <laughs> I've just seen that. that vibe. I spotted the tattoos, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, you, you talk, you've talked so much in the lead up to this event about how important it is to activate in the United States, and and this is the hub. But like the United States is 50 states, and so we want something big in New York, or we want something else in in the East Coast. Do you see other opportunities in the United States outside of Tracktown that that are important for us to tap into right now? Look, I, I'm really grateful. To, mm-hmm. Yeah, to this is great. <clears throat> the organizing committee here, we've got a great relationship with, uh, well, Governor Kate Brown, you know, the municipal authority, all the people that go to make an event, I'm, I'm bowled over by the mm-hmm. help we've get, been given. But, yeah, we do need to engage other cities, and that's really what I plan to be doing in, in the next few years, and um, particularly in the build-up to L.A. You know, mm-hmm. we've really got to make sure, because it's a win-win anyway. If we are strong, then the Olympic Games will be stronger. You know, if we're not strong, then there are going to be challenges all, you know, right across the board. So, yeah, of course we want mm-hmm. something in you. We did have a Diamond League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we did. It, it, it went New away York. for a while. Yeah. But, it actually you know, got me hooked. That was my first ever pro track uh, meet. And, and, but, you know, we need to be able to understand some of the city challenges as well. But, yeah, it's, a lot of it will be down to communications. A lot of it will be down to what we're calling Project USA going forward. Something that probably fans don't think about that I'm sure you think about all the time is getting those businesses involved and bringing in more dollars. And especially that's a big opportunity in the United States. I think we're, GDP is $19 trillion or something like that. So how Back when $19 trillion was a lot of money. Yeah. So how, <laughs> how do we get those brands that bring in the money that create the opportunities to do the things that you're envisioning? Very important that we do do that. And you know, one of the KPIs we've set ourselves in terms of improve you know expanding the footprint in the u.s is yeah absolutely unashamedly can we get a bigger share of the u.s sports sponsorship market it's a huge market it's the biggest market in the world so you know we've fallen behind on that you know actually if you look at the job that max siegel has done at u.s dragon he's done a great job you know it's particularly around commercial partnerships but we do need to have a bigger share of that cake if you look at most of our partners they do tend to be uh, asian based you know we denser are our marketing partners so there is obviously a focus I- I- in that area but we are employing sub agents uh, to make sure that we also you know drive into to this market so yeah that will be one of the kpis when we look at this roadmap to get to LA, how does, you know, Tokyo and the world championships that you guys just awarded, how does that fit into the picture and the, and the puzzle to, to, to get to LA? It's part of the journey. Mm-hmm. We won a world championships that is got, is really got high profile going back into the Olympic stadium in uh, 2025 is going to be huge. I, I'm really pleased with there because actually the reality of it is most of the athletes competed there. They didn't have the benefit of, of a, you know, big noisy, cosmopolitan crowd they will next time out and again it's a it's an important staging post you had mentioned the expansion of more meets and opportunities for athletes but i think one of the things that a lot of maybe casual fans struggle with is knowing where to pay attention and like what's the most important is it do we need to gravitate even more towards the stars is it events is it the country rivalries what do you see as kind of being the focal point i think it's everything i think it's everything look you know we know we know one of the things that really does capture the imagination of the fans is the head-to-heads. Mm-hmm. We need more head-to-heads. We need, look, uh, I will say this. I think athletes need to com- be com- to compete more often. You know, I think sometimes there's a little bit of a prissiness around the kind of competitions that the tennis players and other pro sports take for granted. Uh, I think we need to, I think the fans need to see the athletes out there more often. I think the athletes on balance would like to do that. There isn't always the, the, the competition uh, available. I want to make, I want to, I really would like at the end of this journey, there's particularly the focus on the US, to have more meetings here because we want it to be a two-way journey. We don't want just US athletes leaving mm-hmm. you know, the US in May or June and then competing solidly other than one stop off at pre uh, uh, around the globe. And we, and we need to make sure that the athletes are competing more and we've, we've got some ideas that we're already talking to the um, athlete reps about and the athletes themselves. 
the big thing that we spoke about last time uh, was the emphasis on athlete storytelling. And, you know, you mentioned how the Drive to Survive series is coming. Like, you, you, it's in the works. Why haven't we gotten the call for, from the casting department to be the, the analyst yet? <laughs> <laughs> Sit by your telephones, guys. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay. Yeah, well, you're, on, you're on standby. So, it, it, no, but being serious, yeah. that's important. We're talking to, you know, EBU are our big uh, broadcast partners. Uh, and we've already started some creative thinking around that space, and we know the difference that that has made in F1. We know the difference that it's made in, you know, and Last Dance and all those. It's it's it can have a big impact. And, and actually, athletes, you know, it, again, there'll be some challenges because that is intrusive. If you want to get behind the scenes, you know, you can't have athletes sitting there going, "Well, you know, I could hear a camera click, you know, from five rows up," and mm -hmm. you know. Th there, it will it will it will need a different mindset and culture to actually exposing and being open to stuff that you know we haven't normally done that you know the immediate aftermath of a disappointment or you know drive to survive some of the best footage is sitting with the drivers in the little area after they've you know <laughs> oh yeah the, in the cool down so in the cool down room yeah, it's fantastic you need to see what's going on behind the scenes so you know, the sport's going. If if the sport goes down that road, and I'm determined that it does, we're going to have to give more of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Something a lot of the sports, especially in the U.S., are now kind of trying to do a better job of is the equity between men's and women's sports. But there's probably no sport out there in the world that is more equitable in terms of men and women. Like we are out there, and we we go men's event, women's event, men's event. and you know personally, I think the women's events oftentimes are way more exciting than the men's events. Is there an opportunity for us to own that a little bit more? Yeah, but you know you're right. I don't enter the moral maze about mm -hmm. you know we're not some sports that are trying to create female moments. I mean. We just I, have it. I come to a trap meet. I don't sit here thinking, oh, it's the women's 800 or it's the, the men's 1500 meters. I sit here going, we're going to have extraordinary competition. Whether it's male or female, whatever it happens to be, we're going to get great competition. You know, the thing that I am focused on much more than equity on the track, and remember, we have equal prize money. Most sports don't. Diamond League. Um, world championships here. The thing I'm most exercised about is still trying to get more women into positions of influence in administration and in coaching and our pathways and our programs that are able to lead into that are really important. And that's why it is so important that women, you know, you create those pathways beyond the competitive mm -hmm. years. All right, that was our brief chat with World Athletics President Sebastian Coe. So, Kyle, part three in Budapest, what are we going to ask him that next time around? I guess we'll see how we're progressing on everything that we just talked about and the vision long term of where we hope that the sport goes. Yeah, because, I mean, there's multiple elements at play here. There's the storytelling factor to it. There is uh, just the athletes, and you know, having to go head to head, as he said, uh, the meet opportunities, like there's, it's Online it's a project. whole web of things that need to go right between now and what he called, what was it, Project LA or something like that, Project US. Uh, so, no, I mean, we've had some conversations with Vin, we've had some conversations with Seb, so uh, we're trying to get in the, the right people's ears here and there. Yeah, yeah, and you know, obviously there's conversations happening outside what people are seeing, oh, so, yeah. um, you know, I think the... He, they've got the vision and we're hoping to get there yeah. and we're, we're trying our best to help, but um, we really do appreciate his, I mean, I can't imagine having a busier schedule than what he must yeah. have this week. And he made the time for us. Wow. Uh, all right. So the final interview that we've got for you guys today is with two time Olympic champion, former decathlon world record holder, Ashton Eaton. Uh, so, Kyle, can you kind of set this up for the people who are uh, about, or about to see it? Yeah, so, you know, um, Ashton retired in 2017, a, obviously a super successful career as an athlete, and now is working full-time in corporate life. And, you know, I don't have nearly as many gold medals as he does, but I've made a similar transition after my own running career into the corporate world. And I was really excited about this one, and I think it turned out great. Uh, we just kind of sat back, asked each other some questions, talked about that transition, 
and what helped and what might help future athletes. And this, I, I really think, you know, this conversation will be important well beyond the world championships, which we really, we don't talk that much about worlds or anything going on here. It's much more about big picture stuff as an athlete. So whether you're currently competing in high school, college, professionally, or your coach or parent, um, or friend, you know, I do think that hopefully there's some valuable tidbits that you take away from, you know, one of the best to ever do it. Yeah. So we'll break out all of these conversations actually for in the coming weeks on the Sidious Mag podcast. And this one is fairly evergreen. So as Kyle said, like, uh, if you're an athlete out there, you can pay particular attention. If you know someone out there who's trying to navigate that, you know, post-competitive life, there's a ton of, you know, gems of wisdom here that are, are dropped. So, Mac, are, are we ready to, to roll the interview? And you'll you'll get to hear what uh, Ashton's best event would be if he right had now. to compete in a decathlon today. Right now. All right, here's Ashton Eaton with Kyle Merber. All right, so... I'm not being joined today by my normal co-host, Chris Chavez or John Anderson. Instead, I'm sitting down with the man who needs no introduction, two-time Olympic gold medalist, former world record holder, Ash Neaton. And I'm really excited about this conversation because we're going to, we'll probably touch on some sure. track and field and athletic stuff, but we I also hope we do. Talk. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's been a few years since you have finished competing. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I've finished my career and... I guess I want to start by kind of catching up. What have you been up to? What is life like, you know, now that you're retired from your first life? Yeah, I, I'm glad you said retired from your first life because I don't want to be fully retired. And I think a lot of people see athletes who retire with some success and they're like, oh, you can just retire and like go chill now. It's like, no, I really can't. <laughs> not baseball players. Yeah, right? not baseball, yeah. not football players. But um, I think first and foremost, the priority that I'd like to highlight is the family. Yeah, let's do that. So, some uh, exciting news. Yeah, so we have our son. His name's Ander. He's two and a half. Um, and we just had our second child, our daughter. Her name's Elian, and she's six weeks old. Congrats, man. Yeah, yeah. So we're pretty excited about that. What uh, are you doing here? What am I, yeah, <laughs> no, trust me. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to go down and have a great day in Eugene. Brianne, you just chill up in uh, at home and take care of the kids. No. Um, it's, it's actually... All right, so we made the executive decision here. Uh, you know, it's day f uh, day five. We finally hit a uh, technical difficulty. Our feedback. first one, so we're gonna run it back real quick. Uh, no, we're going to uh, table this interview with Ashton Eaton until tomorrow. We just saw that the audio isn't matching up, uh, so we're gonna do our best to fix it and bring it to you guys tomorrow. Um, just because, like, it's such a good conversation that I think like um, we want nothing to be too distracting and you know give it to you guys high quality so uh, stay you'll catch the rest of that interview tomorrow on Sidious Mag Live um, many thanks to everyone who's watching right now I see you guys in the chat it's been fairly active be sure to subscribe to the channel just because that's where we're tossing up Every interview in the mix zone that we're getting from the athletes we're doing this show we're doing our daily podcast at Which the end of the night we're gonna go live fairly quick after tonight's action so if you watch tonight's races and you want to talk about it and you want to get our reaction right after the race we're going to rush back from <laughs> from the stadium and hopefully within uh, you know 30 minutes after the the last lap after the final lap we'll be back on to do our champ chats podcast uh, that we've been putting out daily on the Sidious Mag podcast feed so uh, many thanks to everyone who uh, joined us today Emma, Emma Bates, Joe Klecker, Robert Griffin III, Trayvon Burmell, uh, Marvin Bracey, Maurice Sebastian Coe, Maurice Green. What a just crazy <laughs> sentence. Um, and, of course, to the man behind the camera, Mac Fleet, for putting all of this together. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. We'll catch you again uh, later today or tomorrow.